broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Great. We are good to go, so I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, and Juanita, if you could please call roll. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Supervisor Gates. Here. Supervisor Galvin. Here. Supervisor Sellers. Here. Supervisor Gallardo. Here. Chairman Hickman. And here. Thank, Thank you, you, Juanita. So thanks everybody for joining us today. It's a big it's a big day at the county, and it's starting exactly eight minutes late because of the chairman. So uh, sorry about that. Um, so we'll get going. Um, so item number one is a presentation regarding the Maricopa County FY 2024 recommended budget. I would like to introduce our presenters for agenda item number one, which is the presentation of the FY 2024 Maricopa County recommended uh, budget. So today, Cindy Geltz has joined us as well as Kristen Prindle. So if I could please call you up and we can get started. So great seeing all of you, Kristen. <laughs> all right. Um, or Kirsten, sorry. I can never get the R and the I right. Dyslexic <laughs> in the middle. Um, so welcome. Um, so I know that you guys have been working hard and I'm sure that you're gonna, you've been showing the chiefs all the way through, but let's, let's, let's show the, the big bosses. Yes, good morning, Charlie, members of the board. Yes, we'll get to it. Oops, thanks, thanks, Kirsten. Okay, so um, today Kirsten and I are going to present the 2024 recommended budget. Um, our budget was prepared with a focus on the priorities from Chairman Hickman um, to promote, promote uh, sustainable services and quality of life in Maricopa County. These prior priorities include funding to address homelessness, the opioid crisis, job training and career development, a continued recovery from the uh, 2019 pandemic, initiatives to support growth in our economy. We also have investments in public safety. We're adding positions to both the sheriff's office and county attorney's office. There's support for public health and continued technology improvements to enhance efficiencies and promote transparency. The budget continues the trend uh, of making investments which are one time in nature but provide ongoing benefits. One such investment is the utilization of the balance of our proceeds from a bond issuance from last year that will be used to make additional payments towards our unfunded pension liabilities in the PSPRS and the corrections officers retirement plans. What that will do for us is lower the operating costs in the future. In addition, the budget includes um, uh, um, American Rescue Plan Act funds to support programs and address affordable housing, homelessness, community health, small and small business resilience. We include an ambitious capital plan providing the buildings and infrastructure necessary to meet the growing demands for services. Our county is a large county with a, a variety of mandates and demands on it. And in order to compile this sustainable, responsible plan, we needed guidance and collaboration. We are fortunate to have had the, such direction provided by Chairman Hickman. His leadership and direction are so appreciated. In addition, I'm grateful for Scott Isham, who was always available to us when we needed to have any hurdles um, addressed, and Michelle Montillo, who helped us through the process. The entire board and their chiefs dedicated an enormous amount of time as we developed this process. As Chairman Hickman mentioned, the chiefs and deputy chiefs met with us every week, and we went through every single above base request for each department. Their varied points of view, experience, and knowledge provided us valuable insight as we crafted this plan. We appreciate the responsiveness and the collaboration that we received from all departments, the elected officials, the presiding judge, and justice of the peace. The only way for us to get to a sustainable, balanced budget is if we all work together. As we go through the presentation, you'll see details of, about this spending plan. However, this slide, it depicts a few highlights. First is that there's going to be a reduction to the property tax rate. It's going from a dollar 0.2473 cents to a dollar 0.2044 cents per hundred dollars of net assessed value. In addition, both the flood control district and the library district will also have reduced property tax rates. The budget is structurally balanced. That means that ongoing revenues are at or above ongoing expenses. So we will not be creating any liabilities for the future. It contains two months of reserves in our major operating funds 
as well as several of our special revenue funds. So we are prepared in case there's a shock to the economy. And we have funded all retirement contributions at the rates provided by the actuary. And again, as we mentioned, we're going to be setting some funding aside to address our unfunded liability. And finally, it, uh, invest in capital and infrastructure for the county. Back in January, the board approved guidelines for us to develop the budget. Those included that we were to develop a sustainable budget that advances the county's mission and its strategic goals. It directed human resources to develop a targeted employee compensation strategy. It required all departments to submit their budgets within their baseline. And it prioritized the use of one-time monies, first to set our reserve levels, second to address any cost escalation for existing um, capital projects. Finally, we were able to evaluate all the increases that were in the budget for their impact on the expenditure limitation. I'm happy to report that the budget that's being presented to you today is in complete alignment with these guidelines. Each year we develop the budget with a set of assumptions. First and foremost, as we talked about previously, is that the budget needs to be structurally balanced as to not impose a liability for the future. Second is that we use the pessimistic growth rate from our economists in order to forecast our major revenue sources of state church sales tax, vehicle license tax, and the jail excise tax. We included contingencies in the budget based on historical utilization, also for identified issues that we needed to fund during the year, and other revenue risks and unanticipated shocks from the economy. And as also provided for in the guidelines, we set aside two months of reserves in both our general and detention funds. Each year when we develop the budget, we consider a variety of economic indicators. A key indicator that we considered this year is the change to population. As has been reported, Maricopa County continues to outpace all other counties in the nation for growth in population. While population drives revenue growth, it also drives increased demands for services. We will see how those increased demands impact the budget as we go through the presentation. Okay, so for fiscal year 24, the recommended budget is 3 billion, oh, sorry, 4 billion, <laughs> 4 billion, 352 million, uh, $282,707. The largest area of funds that we will be expending next year is actually going to be from fund balances at 966 million or 22.2%. These, the fund balance is used to fund one-time expenditures, so it's not used for our ongoing operations. So when we get to look at our capital plan or those investments in um, our pension, that's where you're going to see those funds coming from. The next largest source, and this is up from number two last, or number three last year, is our state shared sales tax, which we are estimating at 926 million, or just over 21 percent. The other intergovernmental and grants moved down from the second spot to the third spot at 822 million. This is just under 19% of all the sources this fiscal year. So as we are working through the ARPA funding and other grant funding that came as a result of the, um, the COVID pandemic, we're seeing that shift between the intergovernmental revenues and all our other revenue sources. So because last year it was at the top, now it's, it's moving downwards. Next is property taxes, penalties, and interest. This is $660 million or 15%. What's interesting to note is that prior to the pandemic, this source was actually, it swapped year, um, year over year. Sometimes it was the first source of revenue, sometimes it was the second, between state shared sales tax and the property taxes. Now it's down at number four, and it's been here for several years. And that is really due to a couple things. Obviously, we're spending one-time money for our um, enhancements to our, our capital plan and the ARPA funding. And then the board has taken action over the past several years to reduce the property tax rate. So that really is driving that revenue source um, down to that fourth position. The fifth and sixth largest categories are permits, patient revenues, fees and fines, and charges for services. And that's at 7%. And then our sales tax, which is actually our jail excise tax, and that is at 6.21%. Uh, the seventh largest source is our uh, 
vehicle license tax, state share vehicle license tax at 225 million or about 5%. And the last two revenue sources are our highway user revenue funds at 3% and miscellaneous interest and other revenues at 22.7 million or just under 1%. Okay, so where do we use the funds? As has been the trend for many years, the largest portion of expenditures is going to be in the area of public safety, where we're about 50% of the expenses will hit $2.2 billion. Our public safety budgets include budgets for the sheriff's office, county attorney, the superior court, adult and juvenile probation, the clerk of the court, justice courts, constables, public defense, Planning and Development, Emergency Management, the Public Fiduciary, and ICGIS. The next largest category is Health, Welfare, and Sanitation. That is estimated to be at $1.2 billion next year, or 28% of the budget. The ARPA funding and other grant funds continue to comprise a lot of expenditures in this category. The departments in this area include Correctional Health, Public Health, Human Services, Environmental Services, Air Quality, the Medical Examiner, and Animal Care and Control. In addition, this category includes large expenditures that the county is mandated to pay to the state of Arizona for health care costs. The next largest category is our general government category, which includes the assessor, the recorder, elections, the treasurer, the star call center, county management, the board, clerk of the board, our internal audit, and all the central service departments. The expenditures here are actually down from the prior year, about $30 million at 615 million or 14% of the budget. And that is due to the completion or the, the completion of the admin building revamp. Expenditures for highways and streets are the next largest categories and their projects um, is 6% of the budget or about $262 million. And rounding out the expenditures are culture and recreation for our parks department and education, which is our county school superintendent's department. On this slide, we're illustrating, um, in essence, that use, that large use of fund balance. So here we see of our expenditures in fiscal year 24, um, we have about 2.5 billion, almost 2.6 billion of operating expenditures and 1.8 billion of non-recurring expenditures. So you can see a large portion of our budget, almost 40%, is dedicated to non-recurring expenditures. Prior to the pandemic, that was about 20%. We saw it begin to creep up in fiscal year 21 um, with the influx of CARES that moved to 30%. Then in fiscal year 22 and 23, because of ARPA funding, it went to 35 and 46%. As we're depleting the ARPA funds, that will be coming back down. However, what's important to note is these one-time investments are really going to give us some payoff in the future to reduce some of our operating costs. As we talked about earlier, we are seeing large increases still in our uh, state shared revenues. Our forecast reflects continued growth above the budgeted level for all of our major revenue sources in fiscal year 23, as you can see on the graph. For fiscal year 24, we're going to build on that, but due to the uncertainty of the sustainability of the growth, and similar to what we did in fiscal year 23, the budget continues to dedicate a portion of these revenues for one-time expenses rather than building our operating budget up to the level of this revenue source. Due to economic uncertainty and growing concerns with inflation, all of our revenues were budgeted by applying the pessimistic inflator to our 23 forecasted revenues. For the third consecutive year, the property tax rate will be cut it will be going down from 1.2473 in fiscal year 23 to 1.2044 for fiscal year 24. In addition, the flood control district and the library district will also have reduced rates. So the combined county tax rate of all the county controlled property taxes will be going down more than five cents from 1.4570 to 1.4068 when you combine them. As you're aware, the Arizona Constitution establishes a limit on the amount of primary taxes that can be levied. The levy for fiscal year 24 is $659 million. This represents 73.9% of the maximum levy allowed. The maximum levy for the county in fiscal year 24 is $891.9 million. 
So we are about $232.8 million below the maximum amount that we could levy. A quick question. I Mr. think Chairman. I've asked this question every single time we do it. Where are the other counties um, with this? I know I know that there are several counties that are right at their expenditure limit. Where, where are we sitting in relation? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I came prepared this year for this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Several counties are below their maximum levy below what we are. So Greenlee, Pinnell, Cochise, Gila, and Mojave, they're all below where we sit. And this is based on last fiscal year as well mm -hmm. because we don't know the, the, the levies yet for the fiscal year 24. Mm -hmm. So the balance of the counties, Pima, Santa Cruz, Yavapai, Navajo, Graham, Yuma, La Paz, Apache, and Coconino are all levying more, more than we are as, as a ratio to their maximum levy with La Paz, Apache, and Coconino being at 100%. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, Phil. Thank you. Um, Cindy, this is, I want to ask you this because uh, clearly, so the rate, this proposed budget has a lower property tax rate, but we'll, we'll get in these debates with some of our friends about whether, what, what's your assessment? Is that an accurate statement to say that we'll be cutting people's property taxes if we approve this budget? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, so this is a truth in taxation rate. So really what it's saying is in aggregate, the properties that were taxed last fiscal year, again, in aggregate, um, their levy will be the same in fiscal year 24. And the only increase to our levy is really for any new property that was added to the rolls. However, for any individual taxpayer, it's going to vary because it really is going to be based on how much their assessment went up relative to every other property owner. Mm -hmm. So um, at... In a generalized statement, yes, the property taxes should be at the level that they were last year, not an increase. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, um, and, and there's a limitation as well under state law on how much the evaluation can go up. Is that right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Gates, yes. So for residential property, uh, it cannot increase, uh, the valuation cannot increase more than 5% even though maybe the, the actual value has increased. It won't correct. as it relates to the assessed value. That is correct. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Jack. Yeah, and this may be something you get to later, but looking at uh, public safety being 50% of our budget and 40% of our revenue is non-recurring, how much of the public safety budget is non-recurring? Um, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Sellers, when we get to the capital slide, I think our capital investment is about 40% of our capital projects, which is really that non-recurring funding. About 40% of that is associated with public safety. A lot of our other um, non-recurring expenditures are associated with the ARPA grants, so those are actually primarily in the healthcare area, the health, welfare, and sanitation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, just as a reminder though, um, in August we're gonna be updating this slide um, once we get all the tax rates from all the taxing jurisdictions in the county, but last fiscal year, the county's primary property tax was 11.44% of all the taxes levied in Maricopa County. Okay, so a little bit more about the American Rescue Plan Act funding. So as you may recall, this was signed excuse me, back in March of 2021, and it provided the county with $871.2 million worth of funds. The county to date has allocated 100% of these funds based on actions that the board has taken to approve the spending. To date, we have spent about, and this is through March, sorry, we have spent $333.9 million, and we're forecasting to have spent about $377.1 million by the end of fiscal year 23. The remaining $494 million is included in the budget as one-time spending. And it's all funds must be obligated by the, by the end of calendar 24 and spent by the end of calendar year 26. This pie chart illustrates how the funds, the funds for this um, ARPA funding have been appropriated. It's primarily used to respond to the negative impacts um, of the pandemic, including support to communities, 
households, small businesses, nonprofits, and the public sector to recover from the economic impacts. We're also using some funds to invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. The largest amounts allocated include $275.2 million for individuals and families, $224.8 million for the public health response, and $156.4 million for affordable housing. The departments that use this funding primarily are the public health department and the county's human services departments. Mr. Mr. Chair. Bill first. Uh, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Vice Chairman. <laughs> yeah, maybe we had the same question. I'm wondering on this: is do do we have uh, do, do we have any data? Do the feds have data as far as what this what the um, division uh, of the uh, expenditures among these different categories is on a national basis? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware. Um, I will look into. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates. I, I can look into that and get back to you on how other counties have utilized their funding. If we can get information back, yeah, that'd be great. We all, we all um, submit reports. And just to be clear, there was there was no requirement under ARPA that a certain percentage go into these different categories, right? It was just it needed to be in one of these categories. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, I'm not aware of any requirements. Okay, thanks. Jack, some of the uh, discussions going on in Washington right now around the debt ceiling, uh, they're talking about possible clawbacks to COVID funds. Do we see any of that impacting anything that we're do doing here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Sellers, I've not been uh, apprised of any funding that's in danger as a result of that. Okay. So as you know, the county is required to make payments to the state of Arizona for certain health care costs. In fiscal year 24, that amount will total $335 million that will be paid to the state of Arizona for the Arizona health care cost containment system, the Arizona long-term care system, and behavioral health services from the Arnold v. Sarn case. In addition, due to action taken by the, in the legislative session, this most recent session, Maricopa County is now the only county in the state that is required to make payment for juvenile corrections. The total for that is expected to be $6.7 million in fiscal year 24. The total amount of the county's operating, the general fund operating budget that it will be remitted to the state will be 18.2%. That is up from 17.7% .7 in fiscal year 23. While the state budget has passed, the legislature is still officially in session. We were monitoring several bills along the way, um, some of which we are still keeping an eye on in case they come back. The first is a constable salary increase, which would add expenses to the county budget for next year. The second is a change to the valuation of business personal property. There, um, there is a proposal to change the valuation which will result in the elimination of that tax um, or tax on that property for our property taxes, which would negatively impact the county's property tax revenue. And finally, a, a bill that we were tracking that was um, one that would have been beneficial was a proposal to allow a pay down of the unfunded pension liabilities for the elected official and probation officer retirement plans. That's unique because those plans are shared amongst multiple jurisdictions. Um, that plan did not move forward, that piece of legislation did not move forward, but we are prepared to engage in a conversation about it if it were to come back. Thanks to Michelle, Danny, and Israel for keeping us up to date on everything that's happening down at the legislature so we can make sure that we can properly include any impacts in our budget each year. So before I turn it over to Kirsten, um, she's gonna go through all the departmental budget changes. There are several changes that are countywide in nature that I wanted to just touch on. We're not gonna show these on each slide. The first is the net change to our retirement contributions. We'll be putting another $7.7 .7 million into our retirement costs next year. But I did wanna note that, um, I don't know if you recall, but at the end of fiscal year 22, so after we had done the, the bond issuance during calendar year 22, 
we did make a payment into PSPRS, um, about $40 million. And while all the other retirement plans, the rates went up for fiscal year 24, the PSPRS rate actually went down 1%. So we only made a small contribution in fiscal year 22, so that's why we only have a small reduction. I anticipate next year once we see the, um, the impact of the amount that we put in in fiscal year 23, which was $260 million between the PSPRS plan and the court plan, we should see a nice reduction to our um, retirement rates next year, provided that their investments hold. I, I guess I need to qualify that. Um, Mr. Chair. Bill. Just a quick question on that. Do we know what happened to the other counties um, during that same period? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, I do not, but I can find out. Okay. Uh, safe to assume maybe they went up? Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, all the rest of our plans where we did not make a contribution went up. Okay. So I would, I would say yes. Yeah. That's a safe assumption. Thank you. Um, in addition, we have telecom and radio charges countywide that are going up $2 million, impacting all budgets, and then our risk management charges are going up $5.5 .5 million, so that would be um, impacting all the various county budgets. And now Kirsten's gonna take over and talk about departments. All right, so starting with constables, the constables general fund operating budget includes 15,000 to restore funding for a deputy constable and, inact and inactivate an administrative clerk in the warrants division. The constables warrants division was also approved as a permanent program, but no additional funding was required. Constables also provided us with the cases served and attempted through quarter one of 2023, which we have included on this slide. The county school superintendent general fund operating budget is recommended at 3.2 million and the detention fund operating budget is recommended at 325,000. One time contingency of 150,000 is available for an IT infrastructure refresh. The Sheriff's Office General Fund operating budget includes additional funding of 5.9 million for overtime and overtime benefits, 2.6 million for staff and ongoing maintenance costs for the records management system community aided dispatch system upgrade, 2.7 million for IT related costs, 2.1 million for vehicles repairs, maintenance and fuel, and 424,000 for six more deputy service aid positions. New one-time funding of 939,000 is for key technology upgrades and 670,000 for specialty vehicles and equipment. In the equipment services budget, there's also 3 million for new vehicles for patrol, the deputy service aids, and an aging vehicle replacement. The RMS CAD system upgrade is approved as a capital project for 7.9 million and contingency of 3.7 million has been set aside for the fixed wing airplane. The compliance budget includes $1 million for a contract increase for investigative services, $763,000 for four civilian investigator positions and contract civilian investigators, and 305,000 for IT upgrades for body-worn camera integration with evidence.com and text archiving. The equipment services budget includes 1.4 million for vehicles for the investigator positions, and the Axon body camera and taser refresh contract renewal is in contingency until the contract is finalized. This slide shows the total cost of Melendros by category over the years. Through fiscal year 22, the county has spent 200.5 million. The estimated FY23 spending is 34.3 million, and the FY24 budget is 38.6 million, bringing the total to 273.4 million over the past 16 years. As shown in the upper left-hand corner of the chart, the top three costs are spending within the sheriff's office, monitor and related costs, and plaintiff attorney fees. The detention fund operating budget includes 3.5 million for body scanner staffing and maintenance, 
1 million for the shield jail management system ongoing maintenance costs and 113,000 for jail controls. Two vehicles for the sheriff's inform sheriff information management services and victims rights units are in the equipment services budget for $100,000. The Clerk of the Superior Court General Fund operating budget includes $445,000 for a subsidy for positions and special revenue funds that can no longer be supported by the revenue received, and $179,000 for two courtroom service, services supervisor positions to improve the staff to supervisor ratio. The adult probation general fund operating budget is increasing due to reduced allocations to the fee fund as a result of declining revenues for 1.6 million and probation case management system positions for 455,000. Contingency has been set aside for the one-time implementation costs for the probation case management system of 3.1 million and licensing fee for service costs of 1.3 million. The detention fund operating budget is recommended at 50.1 million. Juvenile probation did not request any additional funding. The general fund operating budget is recommended at 26.4 million and the detention fund operating budget is recommended at 40.1 million. The Superior Court General Fund operating budget includes 1.5 million for positions to support the probation case management system, probate and mental health, criminal court, and jury administration. There's also 835,000 to shift expenditures from the fill the gap fund for court commissioners that can no longer be supported by the revenue received, 686,000 for the for the record system maintenance and support, 301,000 for security officer differential compensation and 230,000 for security equipment maintenance. One-time funding is for a resource allocation consultant and social worker positions for the Cradles to Crayons program. Justice courts do not request any additional funding. The general fund operating budget is recommended at $26.3 million. The table on the slide compares Justice Court's data for fiscal year 22 and 23 over the same time period. Overall filings are up 20%. In emergency management, the contract renewal for the security guards resulted in additional funding of $100,000 needed for pay increases and a night supervisor. Correctional Health did not have any operating above baseline requests. They requested $3 million for their electronic health sy record system upgrade, which has been recommended as a capital project. The Assessor's General Fund operating budget includes additional funding of 463,000 for contract and license increases, 159,000 for a data architect position that will focus on data integration and management, $100,000 for aerial photography and oblique imagery, and $80,000 for customer experience development through Digital First Solutions. One-time funding of 646,000 is for the continuation of Digital First Solutions to automate processes for data for address validations, configure application programming interface platforms, automate applications, and deeds processing. The Elections General Fund operating budget includes additional funding of 519,000 to allocate personnel costs from the surcharge fund due to lower revenue, 464,000 for IT projects, and 262,000 for MPAs for election staff. The tabulation equipment budget is recommended at 2.5 million ongoing. One-time funding of 235,000 is recommended for IT projects. 
The primary and general election cycle budget of 10.1 million is for the presidential preference election and preparation costs for the primary election. Mm -hmm. Contingency has been set aside for the purchase of the ballot on demand printers and the licensing costs. The Recorder's Office General Fund budget also includes funding of 649,000 to allocate IT personnel from the surcharge fund due to lower revenue, plus additional funding of 295,000 for recording software, document management, and website refresh annual licensing, 260,000 for constituent services software projects, and 260,000 for AI software, for voter registration and recording documents. One-time funding of a million dollars is for the recorder website refresh, recording database application update, cubicle refresh, and server room decommission. The treasurer did not have any baseline requests. The general fund operating budget is recommended at nine million and the taxpayer information fund budget totals 125,000. The county attorney general fund operating budget includes 1.5 million for 21 new positions. The 14 evidence specialist positions will review and redact body worn camera footage. The two community affairs coordinator positions will allow MCAO to expand community outreach efforts. And the five civil positions will provide support for the increased public records requests and digital civil litigation needs. The Public Defense System General Fund Operating Budget includes additional funding of $7.4 million for the Adult Criminal Contract Council rate increase and $1.2 million for an investigator rate increase. One-time funding of $500,000 is for the Office Space Expansion Project in the Downtown Justice Center. The current e-procurement application agreement will expire in fiscal year 24. Additional operating funding of 50,000 is for the licensing costs and one-time funding of 200,000 is for the implementation of the application upgrade. The Animal Care and Control General Fund operating budget remains flat at 945,000. The shelter fund continues to be subsidized by the general fund to cover the revenue shortfall with an increase of 1.4 million added to the transfer in the fiscal year 24 budget in order to cover additional costs related to positions, supply and utility costs for the new East Valley animal shelter, personnel adjustments and internal service charges. This brings the total subsidy to $7.8 million. The non-recurring budget is for moving and supply costs for the new East Shelter, mobile veterinary clinics, county rebranding, digitizing field notices, and allocations from ITC. The Environmental Services General Fund operating budget is increasing by 281,000 for vector control positions, lab supplies, vehicle fuel, and maintenance. The operating budget also includes 190,000 for repairs, maintenance, and equipment rental for erosion control at the landfills and repairs and maintenance at the transfer stations. The vector controls Fogger replacement budget is increasing by 17,000 due to price increases for the equipment. One-time funding of 648,000 is for vector control equipment, lab space build out, and a vehicle for one of the new positions. 408,000 is for erosion control for post-closure care at the Queen Creek and Rainbow Valley landfills, and asphalt repair and maintenance at the Cave Creek transfer station. The Parks and Recreation General Fund operating budget includes new funding of 446,000 to support the Maricopa Regional Trail ongoing repairs and maintenance costs. This includes four parks maintenance positions, trail major repairs, signage, supplies, tools, replacement gates, and box culverts.
The Human Resources General Fund operating budget includes additional funding of 145,000 for the increase in the number of background checks, 15,000 for Liz Biz Library training videos cost increase, 75,000 for recruitment efforts, including another county job fair, and $100,000 for the succession planning program. The system's operation budget is increasing by 647,000 for expected contract increases for workday, ADP checks, time clocks, and Kano smart testing software, as well as an FMLA tracking system to track departments FMLA more efficiently. The OET General Fund operating budget includes 158,000 for expansion of cybersecurity tools due to increased demand for licensing, servers, software, and data streams. The major maintenance operating budget increase is for expansion of Okta for use by all county departments for 358,000 and licensing renewals for cybersecurity tools that were previously purchased as three-year agreements using CARES funding for 1.1 million. New one-time funding is for the continuation of digital county initiatives, allocation of project manager's salary and benefits from the internal service funds, and the ServiceNow customer expansion. The ICGIS Detention Fund operating budget includes additional funding of $100,000 for professional service contract increases and hardware and software support. The Facilities Management General Fund operating budget is increasing by $4.9 million for three new positions to manage 430,000 square feet of space coming online in fiscal year 24, mm -hmm. repairs and maintenance costs primarily due to contract rate increases and utility costs. The budget increase in the general fund was partially offset by a reallocation of $2 million from the detention fund operating and major maintenance budgets. One-time funding of 265,000 is for project management, environmental tracking, and energy cap software, repairs and maintenance costs for facilities going out of service, and an allocation from real estate. I can't go back. Maybe I'm not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so, oh, one more front. Well, well, there we there. go. There we go. All right. So the last department that we're gonna highlight is our department. It seems interesting that it just wouldn't show up there. Um, I am grateful for your willingness to uh, fund this request. Um, we added, mid-year, a special projects manager to our team, Vicki Hansen, and she has just been invaluable helping us sort through um, some of the items that we're dealing with this year, and we are so happy to have her here, and I'm very grateful that you um, were amenable to funding this request for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, capital. Here, um, so our capital budget for fiscal year 24 is Four hundred seventeen million one hundred fifty-two thousand one hundred and sixty-one. Hmm. Wow, that really zoomed forward. Uh, one more back. There's two more back. Two more. Yeah. Okay. Um, of that, thirty-nine percent is for public safety-related projects, um, primarily with the sheriff's office. Just keep. <laughs> Um, I'll just talk. You have the slides in front of you. <laughs> yes, I do. I'm looking at it. Okay. Yeah. So the next largest area is our um, highways and streets capital budget. That's about 35% of the capital plan for next fiscal year. Um, then falling to third place is actually general government. So this slice went down from the prior year because of the, the completion of the admin building revamp. And then we have parks and recreation and health, welfare, and sanitation as the last two pieces of the pie for our capital budget. And we're gonna talk about all these projects in a little bit more detail. 
So um, for each of the slides that we're gonna have for the capital project, if they're existing projects, you're gonna see um, what we're gonna spend in fiscal year 24 and the total project cost. And in addition, you'll see if any new funding was required for fiscal year um, 24 to be added to the project. So starting with parks, we have 14 pr parks projects that are currently underway that will continue into fiscal year 24. Several of them required additional funding in order to complete. They include the boundary fencing at an additional 350,000, um, host sites for 200,000, day, uh, park stay use for, for Hacienda usury and white tanks, that totals 390,000, and then an additional $13.8 million for the Vulture Mountain project for construction. That would be construction of day use facility, parking areas, trailheads, trails, restrooms, entry stations, ramadas, and playgrounds. Okay, <laughs> all right. So there are three new parks projects. They total $1.6 million. Um, the, it is for educational building improvements, the Joe Foss shooting range, and a parks master plan. Moving on to facilities similar to the parks projects. Cindy, one, one second. I just wanted to, um, for those watching at home, uh, this budget has been important and a lot of what you see happens in this building. But what you also, but why I had a chance to be able to go out and attend the parks board meeting when they were going over the budget and the recommendations. And they wanted to um, just give uh, their thanks uh, to this board about uh, how, how important we feel the parks is. We don't, we don't see it all the time, but our residents get a chance to go out there on weekends and spend time with their families. And it's really important uh, that, that I, I think we just call attention in the budget process, just how important it is for those board memberships and those appointments that we all make to specific boards because they, they really get to dig into this and make us feel good about apportioning money uh, to basically some unsung areas of county business. So they, I just thought I should, call it out to you guys and say how, how but we might hear it from our individual appointed members, but as a board, they were very appreciative this year's budget cycle to take a look at this and, and understand our strategic plan and how to put it forward for the, you know, the, the rest and relaxation of with our, with our residents and how they can spend family time there in those parks. So just thought our board should know that right now. Okay, Cindy. So um, moving on to the facilities projects, of uh, the 24 projects that are continuing from fiscal year 23, six of them are going to require additional funding. Uh, the first one is the Early Childhood Center for the employees. It's $224,000 additional funding is needed there. The juvenile, I'm sorry, the judicial branch uh, fencing project requires another $500,000 for the Sheriff's Office, the uh, Security Surveillance Project requires an additional $26.2 million. Uh, last year, we only funded the design, so this, re this year, really, the funding is being set aside to implement that project. And two substations, both the Mesa substation and um, on the next page, the Surprise substation, they will require additional funds to complete. And then the Southeast Juvenile Facility Remodel. Uh, will require an additional $3.7 million to get it to completion. We have six new facilities projects being added to the CIP in fiscal year 24, the largest of which is um, $179.5 million for a downtown office and election facility. Um, in addition, th there's a project for office space, uh, projects at the Durango campus for electrical infrastructure and the Northwest uh, drainage project. The Star Call Center relocation uh, project is also slated for fiscal year 24. And then we're adding to the CIP the ninth floor of the Central Court building uh, remodels. Um, I think we have in reserve for future years funding for the eighth and the sixth floor. Okay. 
So technology, we have no new countywide technology projects, but there are 11 projects that are continuing from the prior year. The only one that has additional funding associated with it is about $2.1 million for the Enterprise Resource Planning System. That's our financial system. Um, this is part of an upgrade process that we have ongoing. So while it is in addition to this project cost, we're really shifting funds, um, transferring funds from our operating budget to the project in order to be able to complete that. So no new resources were needed for that. There are two department-specific new projects, though, for fiscal year 24, as Kirsten mentioned. Um, we have the CAD RMS system, the computer-aided dispatch system for MCSO at $7.9 million, and the correctional health services uh, electronic medical records or electronic health record system for $3 million. Even with our robust capital plan, we still have about what's... Um, been tagged with a $1.5 billion price tag for several unfunded projects that are um, in n known um, but not yet funded or do not yet have funding set aside in reserves. And the, they're all listed here on this slide. Okay, so FTEs. So as you can see, the number of FTEs actually is going up again in fiscal year 24. We're going to 15,079, um, so it's about a little bit more than 250 more than what was in last year's approved budget. Um, some of these positions were actually added during fiscal year 24, so they're not all new to the budget cycle. Some have been added, I'm mean, sorry, added during fiscal year 23. Um, so they're not all new to the budget cycle. Um, but some of them are. Um, the largest areas, and I think Kirsten talked through most of these, um, but uh, we have the Sheriff's Office. So they're having uh, an increase of 73 overall net, net new positions between the fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24 budget. 46 of those are those security officers to run the body scanners at the jails. Um, we have additional civilian investigators, both added in fiscal year 23, as well as several new for fiscal year 24 and IT positions. The Transportation Department added 52 positions um, since last year. It'll be 41 of which are roadway technicians for cross-training and standardized traffic controls. The Superior Court's year-over-year -year change from the budget perspective is 48 positions. About half of those actually are in the IT area. And those are the, um, the largest areas of increase between the two years. Um, before we move that slide, um, thank you for putting this slide in because I've asked questions, you know, versus um, where we were in 2008 versus where we are now. And um, I talk a lot about economies of scale, especially when uh, other people talk about the growth of government and the, um, the services provided to an ever-expanding population. And that's just, I know it's just rudimentary math, but... If you take a look at where we were with the number of people working here in 2009 with a smaller population versus where we're at right now, the significance of that is really shows economies of scale when it comes to workforce. It also shows just how much investment this county has made in, in technology, new processes and procedures in order to provide you know, a great service level to our community to continue to get projects built, uh, to continue to offer services to our, our county residents. So it's gone from 3.84 to 3.17 workers uh, to support the growth of the county. So I think that this is a very important slide for the public to see uh, when, when we're asked about what we do in a job. So um, my thanks to our county manager and our former county managers for putting us uh, on this path, and uh, we just have a lot of motivated people that probably are doing a lot more uh, with having a fewer people to do it with, and I, I appreciate the, the county employees to continue to keep getting this done. So, sorry, I keep taking you off your game, but this was an important one for me to show the board. So to summarize, um, the budget aligns with the board's guidelines. Uh, we set the tax rate at the truth and taxation rate. Um, the combined rate is going down about five cents. 
between the county, the flood control, and the library district. It maintains structural balance in our fu um, major funds. It has two months worth of reserves set aside, and all our retirement increases are um, the the, con the the actual rates are funded, and we are also paying down some additional unfunded liability in our public safety and correction officers' retirement plans, and we are making large investments into our capital and infrastructure in order to maintain services um, and have buildings and technology available to provide services. With the high interest rates and inflation, it is anticipated that consumer and business spending will slow down. That will impact our major revenue streams. We have been very conservative by applying the pessimistic growth to our major revenues and utilizing even a portion of these one-time revenues as we did in fiscal year 23 to set aside for future one-time expenses rather than grow our operating budget. Paying down our unfunded liabilities will reduce our operating expenses in the future, and we expect to see this play out <coughs> starting in fiscal year 23. This strategy will position us to weather whatever shocks come our way um, and with our conservative planning, it has been valuable in the past, and we would appreciate uh, continuing these practices in the future so we are ready to tackle any downturn that we might face. Uh, so, whoops, what's left? So today, um, we are hopeful that you will approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 24. Um, after that, we will do our required postings and be back here on J June 26th for final budget adoption. And then the third Monday in August, August 21st, will be the property tax levy and property tax rate. Okay. So before concluding, I would like to acknowledge the guidance and support from Jen, our new county manager. She hit the ground running within a couple of days of being the county manager. We were meeting, going over everything everything that we did with every chief or all the chief's meetings and every above base request that we had done since January. She, you know, in a, in a matter of hours, she took it all in. Um, I also appreciate the guidance we had from former county manager Joy Rich and the guidance I've received for now more than 20 years from Leanne Bone. She's been my supervisor off and on since I joined the county. Um, the insight of these three individuals was instrumental in us being able to develop this budget. I also want to express my gratitude to Kirsten and baby girl Prindle who <laughs> stuck with us this whole time and had, you know, did not leave us at the end here. Kirsten really takes pride in ownership in the budget process, and you can tell that um, she is very well versed in everything budget and everything runs smoothly because of her. And I also want to recognize how she leads a wonderful team. They are all very supportive of her and really do a terrific job working with the department so they can understand their needs to be able to put through um, this recommendation to you. So with that, we are concluded with the county portion of this presentation and are available for questions. Okay, um, are there any questions or comments on this proposal or any other items from the budget presentation? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gallardo. All right, I've been dog-earing these pages as we were going through it. So there's a few, most of it is just clarification. Uh, great job, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the budget that has been presented to us. Um, but just real quickly, um, well, I'll start with this one first. This is simple. Going back to page 33, this is the election one. You made a comment about, uh, and, and you may have stated the number. I just don't, re I, I, my mind doesn't work that fast in the morning. Um, the, the presidential preference election, is that included in the primary and general election cycle budget, or is that a, is that a separate number? And what is that number? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gallardo, yes, the presidential preference election is included in that $10.1 million number, and it is $7.8 million of that $10.1 million. 7 8 to, to conduct the presidential preference election? Yes, that is correct. And what's the reimbursement that we get from the state? I know um, it's statutorily, I thought. Mr. Chairman, no? Supervisor Gallardo, it's $1.25 per voter, so the revenue that is budgeted is about $2.1 million. Did we get reimbursed in the last election? Yes, we did. We did. did. And we, we, I'm assuming we will, it's just a lot of, lot of money for it. <laughs> an election that doesn't include independents and a lot of a third of our voter registry of our registered voters are not included. I've always been an advocate to open up the presidential preference election. I know that's kind of a touchy issue with our party folks, 
but nonetheless, that's a lot of money for a presidential preference election. So just want to note that. And then the reimbursement is not even close to the full reimbursement. But nonetheless, um, that's a legislative issue, which I hope one day they, they address. I want to go right back to... And just again, clarification page three: the the truth in taxation rate. What was what was the rate that it's coming down to? What I what's his, what's that dollar amount? I guess the rate that it's. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gallardo. The truth in taxation rate is the rate that we will be setting the property tax. It's a dollar point two zero four four per hundred assessed value. A dollar point two zero four four. What was it last year? Oh, what do we a dollar reduce point. Uh, what was the truth in taxation rate last year? Yeah. Um, I will have to get back to you on that. That's fine. We, you can get back to me. It was just more clarification. And in terms of the overall budget, I, I get it. It, it. Could be a wash for some. Um, but nonetheless, what would be, I guess, the overall reduction within our budget if we reduce it? I'm, I'm okay with with some, you know, these types of measures, I've always said as long as our bills are paid and mm -hmm. the county's fully funded, I'm okay with it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gallardo, the, the overall county budget, how much is it going down? Yeah. It's going down $114 million. $114 million? Yeah, it's primarily in the area of um, non-recurring spending. Wait, in what? Uh, in the area of non-recurring spending, so non-recurring expenditures, one-time expenditures year over year are declining 279 million. Operational costs are increased 164 million. Okay. Very good. Um, again, just clarification. This, this. Uh, oh, there was something else here that caught my eye. Mm. Oh, let's uh, page seven. Um, just the again, we've always. Um, we've always knew in the back of our head there will be a day, and Leanne and I have had this conversation many times, a day because the ARPA dollars that are being used right now to, to help families, um, to help not only families, programs. I mean, it's being used on a lot of, a lot of areas. I know even, uh, I think, the whole uh, uh, broadband situation being paid for by ARPA. There's a lot the ARPAs, we knew there was a day that's going to come down. The, and it's, correct me if I'm wrong, the, inter, the, the uh, intergovernmental and grant, the 18.89%, that's where the ARPA dollars are at this point, right? What's the, I guess, where are we at the ARPAs? I, maybe that's a whole nother discussion on when is that going to all sunset? I know it's coming close, I believe. Almost all of our money has already been allocated into certain areas, but at what point does that curtain just close? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gallardo, uh, we expect to have spent by the end of this year $377 million, so we have about $494 million remaining. We have that program to be spent next fiscal year. Um, I, I'm going to guess it won't all get spent next year's fiscal year, and some will need to be carried forward. Um, we have to have it all allocated by 2024 and all spent by 2026. And um, what we did in fiscal year's 23's budget is that we set aside funding on the general fund operating side in a contingency for what we're calling the ARPA cliff. We carried forward that funding in our fiscal year 24 budget. So we still have that funding available for certain areas of service that would need to continue once the ARPA funding went away. And, 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 and I guess, um I don't need to know now, but I'd be curious to know that when we hit that ARPA cliff, I like, I like that term because that's truly what it is, um, what will that percentage be? When we start talking about our grants, I know it changes. There's a lot moving every year, I get it. But what average would that be pre-COVID? What was we would averagely, averagely, I don't even know that's a word, but on an average, what would the state or the county get when it comes to grant and intergovernmental, because that's part of our source funds. Uh, so I'd be curious. Supervisor uh, Gallardo, yes, and Chairman Hagman, yes. We, um, we can get that information for you, but in the past, um, the top revenue sources were sales and property tax, and they would flip-flop every year, then fund balance, then intergovernmental. Yeah. So it used to be number four. 
Um, so it's yeah. in, you know it made its way up last year, and now it's inching its way back down as we deploy. It'll go the back program. to the number four spot that it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. All right, and just uh, again clarification, page eight. Um, I thought I heard right uh, on the public uh, safety portion, which is I, I mean it's crazy how much money we spend in public safety. I get it though. I mean it's like wow, how can we? And I know everyone from our sheriff's office to our courts and our, our, our justice courts, everyone's working to try to reduce uh, that in terms of, of, of public safety, 50% of our budget going to public safety. Did I hear right? Planning development is included in the public safety portion. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Chairman Hickman, Supervisor Gallardo, yes. Planning and development is part of the public safety grouping of departments. Okay. Is that normal? I don't know. It just, is that because does, of zoning and, is this, is uh, that and, what it is? and infrastructure and water and? Yeah, and Chairman mm -hmm. Chairman Hickman, Supervisor Gardo, the the source of planning and development is from public health and safety laws. That's how zoning was created, and also oh, building safety to help separate uses that might be harmful to each other, and then sense. also building safety to make sure the building doesn't fall down. Makes and, sense. <laughs> I learn something new every day. It just caught me. I mean, I think of, you know, we think, uh, you know, public safety, you think of the mm -hmm. courts, you think of the sheriff, you know, all, all our different departments. And, oh. and then code enforcement is also. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, the only other, let me look at my dog. I, the only other page um, goes right into the justice courts and it just drives, I mean, it's, I wish I had a crystal ball. I wish I had answers. I mean, we, this, this, this county, this board has made the issue of housing and homelessness really a priority. We really have, we shows in our investments in ARPA funding. I don't even know, Leanne, what's the number we used for just in homelessness? Was it like 55? Over 100 million we put in just trying to address folks that live right out here in not only in the zone, but all over in every one of our districts is homelessness is an issue. Um, and, and it seems like it just gets worse. We spend over a hundred million dollars and it seems like it gets worse. I wish I knew how to address this issue. Um, uh, and, and how do you reduce the number of folks that are, are on our streets? Uh, I just don't have answers. I look at the justice courts, uh, an increase of 20%. Um, what is, I guess, in past, and maybe there's something to get back with you, 20% seems like a large increase. It really is. I mean, I get it. We're growing by leaps and bounds, and come growth comes situations like this. But again, it goes back to what's contributing to that. A lot of it is in evic evictions. ARPA money is going mm -hmm. away. How does this work? How do we, I mean, if, if, our, if we're spending uh, millions of dollars in trying to keep folks in their home, yet the eviction rate continues to skyrocket. What happens when the ARPA money goes? You know, we have a number of folks that are out in the street right now. Does that number go up? The ARPA money's gone. So now, how, how are we addressing this issue of, of housing and homelessness? So those are the things that stick in my mind. Um, I'd be curious to know, um, maybe this is a conversation I have with the justice courts in terms of of their, their data and their info, you know, it just seems, that's a lot. A 20% increase is a lot. And, and you have, um, you know, 49% of the cases are evictions, people being thrown out of their homes. Home prices aren't going down, rental, rental uh, 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 fees or, you know, that ain't coming down anytime soon. So those are the things that kind of stick in my mind as we address the budget. Again, we can't solve all the issues, but housing and homelessness continues to be tops. I've always said this when folks would ask me, you know, what am I working on at the county? This is prior to COVID. I always said housing was the number one issue in Maricopa County. It really was. And since COVID, uh, it has tripled, quadrupled, and the need for affordable housing, the need to, for homelessness is just, quadrupled as well. We spent over $100 million and it's gone worse. So those are the things I think about when I address this budget. 
with that, Mr. Chairman, those are all the questions I have. Thank you, ladies. Great job. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the budget. As per as per the usual, Steve, I swear you have the most fiscal conservative viewpoints uh, when we're talking about I need a, a budget. I need a red tie, brother. I need a red tie. <laughs> you, uh, you amaze me on, on some of that. And, and you're also talking about, um, after the pandemic, the massive amount of growth rate, you know, that is occurring here and residents coming and chasing better and better jobs uh, that are coming here. So, and that creates a rental, a higher rent problem. Um, so I, I appreciate your questions on that because we've, we've probably looked at this, this kind of spending for two years and, and with the ARPA money, like what, what can we do with this money that will help long term, not just short term, but what, where do we need to put the money at that, that the money lasts, uh, past, um, it's not just liquid money, but it's it's the pr uh, processes that, and the and the infrastructure that we're we're doing right now. Uh, I know I look at Tempe and and our partnership with with them with a 10-year cycle of what what is that what does that place look like in 10 years and how do we get this that place back into the economy and to help people. So um, anyway, Mr. Chairman, no, I mean no, I don't. I mean I'm. Supportive of the no, budget, yeah. and I'm sure I, I I think it's it's well balanced, and um, it looks like uh, 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 all our constitutional officers are are okay with it. I'm assuming none of them have called me. That's the measuring stick. Yeah. Um, so I'm very supportive of the. Budget. Well, they've called me, Steve. Okay. But <laughs> they haven't called me. So I'm like, well, we've me. tried to work. We've tried to work within it. All right. So, um, other questions or comments, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would echo all of um, Supervisor Gallardo's comments. Congratulations. Thank you for all the hard work, uh, having been chair a couple mm -hmm. times in the past. I know that this is such an important part of, of the role, but, but thank you. I think this is very fiscally responsible and, and thrilled uh, to see t tax relief to our uh, residents for the third year in a row. That's really remarkable. So thank you. And it's a big testament to Cindy and Kirsten. This is just, again, incredible work that you guys do, um, your, your knowledge of this budget and making it all work. Just very, very impressive. Just a couple things. One thing on what Supervisor Gallardo had said about the justice courts. I think, you know, my sense is part of the, the increase in these cases is just as folks get back into the mm -hmm. court system with, with COVID, you know, moving on. But also, for the justice courts to have this kind of an increase and not ask for increase in the number of cases and not ask for a, a uh, increase in the budget speaks to how I think they're using technology. They have gone remote. I think it's a bit of an untold story about the extent to which, you know, so many of these hearings are now remote. So not only are they saving taxpayer dollars, uh, but they're also saving the dollars of the folks not having come into court, things like that, but still dispensing justice. So I think it's just, just an incredible job that they're doing there. And then also just a clarification, Mr. Chair, on the, the 100 million, is that in, uh, for homelessness, is that in this budget that we're talking about, fiscal year 24? I'd be interested in what that number is, both between operating costs and the one-time uh, one expendi one -time expenditures. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, we can get you the breakdown of the amount of that hundred million that's yet to be spent in fiscal year 24 and forward. Great, great. Again, just wonderful job. Um, the rest of my questions I kind of asked as we were going in real time. So I'm, I'm very supportive as well to be able to address the needs of this growing county to provide relief to our taxpayers is really job well done by everybody involved. Thank you. You're welcome, Bill. Thank you. Um, Tom? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yes, I just want to uh, build on those words that we heard. I just want to thank you and your team. Excellent work, excellent presentation. I'm continuously impressed. And then just proud overall of the county, proud of this board and proud of everyone that works here, of our, of our sound fiscal stewardship, of our sound financial footing, how we're able to cut property tax rates, but at the same time provide funding for essential services, especially for public safety. So I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of you, and please tell your team we said thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Jack. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'll just echo what everyone else has said, but I also just want to comment that the last several years, budgeting has been such a complicated process, and I have been so impressed with the way you've worked through all of this. It, it really is a testament to what a great operation and a great county we have, so thank you. Well, before before we move on to, to item two, I, uh, again, my thanks. I think I've Every time you came in to talk to us, I gave thanks to you guys and your and your staff and Le Leanne. Look at how we are talking about this budget now and going line by line. Um, by the way, I ask this question all the time too. Juanita, how many people are actually watching this right now? Chairman, let me find out for you. Okay. It's, it just boggles my mind, even when there's a call out to the public to, hey, make sure and participate and see, see where your tax dollars are going, just how many people. I, my assumption at this point is we do this, this county does this job very well. We're not answering for it uh, very often in the paper uh, or in the media uh, because we just work this stuff all year long and, and work hard at it. You're holding off on having that baby so you could uh, get to this point. So thank you for that. Um, I've talked about that over and over again. Like, hey, don't stick around too long. Um, but uh, I guess a question um, to our new uh, county manager. You, you've been with the county a long time and now, you, now you're in this spot. Uh, and you've been of course, uh, in the departments and, and watch this all the way to this point. Is there, is there something that you spot that we could do different, maybe? Is there something that we could do better uh, as we set this, this budget up? We have the ability because as colleagues, we have chiefs that attend a lot of meetings for us, but we also attend some meetings to get to this point that we can feel good about this budget. Is there, is there some uh, things from the outside looking in and now that you're inside, what's, uh, what, what can we tell our tax paying citizens that they need to know through this process? That's a, that's a good question, Chairman. And, and I've you know, been with the county almost 20 years and I've always been impressed by how fiscally conservative the county has been. And I would say in the last, you know, uh, probably 10 years, as you can see, even from, as you pointed out in the FTE chart, how we've become more efficient and have done more with the same or even fewer resources, as Cindy pointed out. And I think that's a testament to, we have a really talented budget group, Cindy, I just want to say thank you, and Kirsten, and, and our future employee, Baby, <laughs> Baby Prindle. But I, I would say we should keep on doing what's working, and it is working well from the departments on down. They understand about how to be the most efficient and lean operation we can, but deliver the services, as Supervisor Gardo mentioned, that the community needs. So I think we've been doing a tremendous job, and I would say we keep on keeping on. Awesome. Well, uh, the two two items that pop in my head when when we're forming up a budget is um, something I've one number one I've worked on, or tried my best to work on uh, over all these years is the matter of cost shifts, um, at, out, and outright cost sweeps. And I was disheartened once again uh, that one of the cost shifts that remain is is this county continues to pay a disproportionate share of juvenile corrections. Uh, and this is an area we have no guidance. Or look how we're trying to get efficient. Look how we try, tr tr try to provide service. Paying for juvenile corrections for the state uh, when no other county now uh, pays for it, other than that, that, I think that's almost a travesty that the legislature uh, keeps keeps giving us. Um, I if they're going to have us pay uh, for that, we should be able to have a little bit of a vision on how to how to maybe do things better there. And it just doesn't happen. We just write a check at the end of the year. So again, I've I've failed in abating a cost shift that's been there since since I've been here. We've been able to get 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 some vision on that before, but the, this one just doesn't ever seem to end. And I, I, 
if they're going to give us the bill, we should have the ability to uh, run that run that department maybe better um, instead of just paying for this. Um, and then you brought up, Steve, even on your side, you brought up the presidential preference election. Um, how many times have I talked about this? We have a legislature or people in the legislature that tell us that we don't run elections well. And then on elections that we do, we do run, and I think we run them exceedingly well, we have to spend this much money on something directed to us by the legislature. And they don't wanna tell us, hey, you're, you're doing it so bad, we'll take that back over. Okay, so all we do is we get foisted with a bill uh, that, we, that we pay to let county citizens vote in a presidential preference election. Um, it's, not a, it's not a primary, it's a pre preference election. So once again, this is, every year this comes up, I say the same thing. We need to take a look at this. We need to have the legislature take a look at this and if they don't feel that we run elections very well, um, uh, they need to do something about that. They need to talk to the parties uh, and they need to figure, figure that one out other than, again, us offering the best that we can do on an election uh, that's, again, you've mentioned independence. We're, this, is, this is taxation without representation. They, they don't get to participate in this election, but every, their taxpayer dollars go to it. So we really do need to take a look at that. I don't know if it's this year, it's succeeding years, whatever, but it continues to happen. And all we do is get criticized for it. So um, with that, again, thank you guys for working so hard throughout the whole year to bring us to this point. We'll move on to uh, item number two, which is an action item, the adoption of the Maricopa County FY 2024 uh, tw tentative budget. And before I ask for a motion, Thank you, Juanita. There are 40 people watching the webinar today on YouTube with $4 billion uh, that we're talking about today. So uh, appreciate it. Thanks for letting me know. Um, I will now ask, uh, is there a motion for item number two to adopt the FY 2024 Maricopa County tentative budget? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vice Chair. I move that we approve the fiscal year 2024 Maricopa County tentative budget in the amount of $4,352,282,707 by total appropriation for each department, fund, and appropriation unit group listed in the attached schedules. Also adopt the five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal years 2024 through 2028 and approve the attached executive summary. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We will now move to agenda item number three regarding setting public hearings and a special meeting regarding the Maricopa County 2024 budget. Is there a motion for item number three? Mr. Chairman. Jack. I move that we set the public hearing on the budget and a special meeting for June 26, 2023 at the time and location outlined in the agenda and give notice that tax levies and tax rates will be set by this board Monday, August 21st, 2023. Great, I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We will now recess as the Board of Supervisors and convene as the Improvement District Board of Directors. The documents regarding these districts are included in the backup materials where each district is listed along with the associated district assessment or estimated tax rate. Um, so under item number four, the adoption of the FY 2024 tentative budget and number five, set public hearing and special meetings. So is there a motion for items four and five? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vice Chairman. I move that we approve the fiscal year 2024 tentative budgets for all of these special districts and improvement districts as described in the agenda and per the budget request as listed on the attachment. And that we set the public hearing on the budgets along with a special meeting for June 26, 2023 as outlined and described in the agenda. 
Thank you, Jack. Do I have a second? Thank you, Bill. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Hearing none, motion carries. We will now adjourn as the Improvement District Board of Directors and convene as the Flood Control District Board of Directors to consider the tentative budget and set hearing dates for the adoption of the general budget. Uh, Cindy Yels is here for a presentation of the Flood Control District budget. Okay. Um, this is gonna be quick. Uh, okay. The overall expenditures for the Flood Control District for fiscal year 24, 124 million. And um, the, the tax rate proposed is the truth in taxation rate, so it will drop from 15.92 <coughs> cents to 15.36 cents with a levy of 77.5 million. The CIP for the flood control district is 77.6 million, and the <coughs> total of the five year CIP is 557 million. Great, thank you, Cindy. Is, uh, thanks for the presentation. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, I don't, so I'm asking for a motion, I believe, on item number six. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Jack. I move that we approve the fiscal year 2024 flood control district tentative budget in the amount of $126,307,391 for a total appropriation for each fund and appropriation unit group of the flood control district. And that we set the public hearing on budget and, and a special meeting for June 26, 2023, as outlined and described in the agenda for the Flood Control District. Great, thank you. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Um, hmm. Did I get a little bit in front of me, myself? Is it seven and eight? Yes, we that just is do for that seven motion? and eight. We just had a motion. Great, thank you. I didn't call it out, sorry. It's a little bit hard. We will now adjourn as the Flood Control District Board of Directors and convene as the Library District Board of Directors to consider the tentative budget and set hearing dates for the adoption of the final budget. Um, so with the Library District, Cindy. Uh, the library district budget for fiscal year 24 <coughs> is um, just under $36 million. The proposed tax rate is going from uh, 5.05 cents to 4.88 cents for hundred of a net assessed value for a levy of $26.7 million. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, the board of directors will now consider item agenda items 10 and 11, which includes the adoption of the library district tentative budget and the hearings related to final adoption of the budget. Is there a motion for items 10 and 11? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the fiscal year 2024 library district tentative budget in the amount of $35,742,699 by total appropriation for each fund and appropriation unit group of the library district and that we set the public hearing on the budget and a special meeting for June 26, 2023 as outlined and described in the agenda for the library district. Great, thank you, Jack. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Bill. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We'll now adjourn as the Library District Board of Directors and convene as the Stadium District Board of Directors to consider the tentative budget and set hearing dates for the adoption of the final budget. Uh, Ms. Getz. Okay, um, so the overall budget proposed for the Stadium District is $7.5 million, 7.25 million of that is for the car rental surcharge revenue that we received to be um, transferred over to the Arizona Sports and Tourism Authority. The remaining $250,000 is for the um, Stadium District uh, audit cost and central service costs. Great, thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions? Seeing none, the Board of Directors will now consider agenda items 13 and 14, which includes the adoption of the Stadium District tentative budget and the hearings related to final adoption of the budget. Is there a motion for items 13 and 14? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the fiscal year 2024 Stadium District tentative budget in the amount of $7,500,000 by total appropriation for each fund and appropriation unit group of the Stadium District, and that we set the public hearing on the budget and a special meeting for June 26, 2023, 
as outlined and described in the agenda for the stadium district. Great, thank you, Jack. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Tom. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Well, thanks again to our budget staff. Uh, we will now adjourn as the Stadium District Board of Directors and reconvene as the Board of Supervisors. We will now move on to the next presentation regarding the Office of the Maricopa County School Superintendent and the Maricopa County Regional School District. Oh, do you want to take a two-minute break? Let's while while everyone is uh, getting situated, um, we'll take a little two-minute refreshment break, if so needed. Uh, and I would go ahead, uh, if you guys would like to come up, uh, Superintendent Watson joins us today.
Okay, thank you. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. I wanted to make sure um, that we made sure we're all hearing um, the same information. Um, a clear-eyed assessment in, in the county's eyes of where we are, um, where what, what authorities uh, everyone enjoys, and um, we're gonna go from there. So I would ask you to lead us into this presentation. Who, who will be presenting? Leanne? Okay. Okay, Ms. Leanne Bone, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for having giving us the opportunity to present today. Um, Cindy and I are gonna be tag teaming the presentation. Uh, I'll kick it off, turn it over to her, and then I'll finish up at the end. So just to provide an overview of what we're gonna be discussing today, uh, we'd like to start with talking about the accommodation school district and specific to that topic, the authorities and responsibilities under both statute and case law of both the county school superintendent but also the board of supervisors, just so that's abundantly clear. We'll move on to discuss um, findings of prior audits and, and analyses related to the district and some of the concerns that those have brought to our attention, and then talk about the current financial position of the district. Following that, um, we'll talk briefly about the county school superintendent's office. So while the primary focus of our presentation today will be on the accommodation district, we've seen similar financial management concerns within the county school superintendent's office. Uh, so we thought it would be important to review those um, and discuss how those two may impact the county overall. Um, and then lastly, we'll finish up with a discussion on juvenile detention education. Beginning with authorities and responsibilities, um, the county school superintendent, and this is specific, specifically related to running an accommodation district. Um, I have paraphrased here. We do have the full statutes available um, in backup documentation if there's need to look at that. Um, Section uh, Arizona Revised Statute 15308 states that a county school superintendent may provide educational services of an accommodation school. So that's not a shall, that's a may, that's an optional function of the county school superintendent. Um, it also goes on in 15-101 uh, that states, uh, talks about governing boards for school districts, section or subsection 14 of that, talks about the county school superintendent in uh, his or her role serving as the sole governing board member of an accommodation district within their county. And then related specifically due to juvenile detention education, the county school superintendent and the presiding juvenile court judge shall agree on the method of delivery of juvenile de detention center education programming. So uh, within the judicial branch, juvenile probation is one of the uh, three departments within that branch. Juvenile detention is a part of juvenile, the juvenile probation department. The kids in those uh, deten in that well, the one detention facility that we have now, um, have to have education while they're in there. And so that is the agreement uh, that that statute references. It is a mandated service. Um, it may be operated through an existing accommodation school, um, that's what the statute allows, or if it's not operated through an accommodation school, the county school superintendent shall deposit the payments into the detention center education fund. So that's uh, something we'll talk about a little bit more later. I think it's also important to note that the term um, method of delivery of uh, educational services is not defined in statute. Moving on to discuss the authority and responsibilities of the County Board of Supervisors related to an accommodation district. Uh, just a little bit of background, two statutes combined discuss that prior to January 1st of 2010, that a county board may only fund services for a variety of transportation needs and the establishment and conduct of accommodation schools via an intergovernmental agreement with the county school superintendent and that IGA would set forth the county's financial responsibilities. Um, section 15.1001 states that the Board of Supervisors shall, and this is in quotes here because it's a uh, uh, direct quote from the statute, annually budget for the Special County School Reserve Fund an amount to meet the requirements of that fund, which could include an accommodation school. Um, this issue was litigated uh, thoroughly about 15 years ago. And so the case law related to that is really um, important when understanding the specific responsibilities of the board. So 
um, the case law says the board has the authority to determine whether and in what amount, if any, to provide funding for an accommodation district. It further goes on to state even more specifically, the board has no obligation to provide funding. So going back to that 151001, really what this is saying is if the board chooses to fund the accommodation district, they would have to do so by dep depositing funds into a special revenue fund called the Special County School Reserve Fund. Questions about any of that so far? Any questions? Just one. one. Um, is there anything in statute that, that um, would prohibit the county uh, in in uh, partnership with our superintendent from contracting that out? I mean, there are schools, private schools, agencies uh, that do provide this type of level of services for, for some of our kids. Is there anything that would prevent us from saying, hey, let's bring in an outside vendor to provide this service for this? You know, it's a small, unique uh, group of students here. Is there anything that would prevent us from looking at that type of an option? Uh, Chairman Hickman, Supervisor Garrido, not that I am aware of, but that's probably a question that's um, probably better researched by somebody with a law degree. Okay. And going back, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, because I know there's, we're going to have a lot of discussion here. I was um, folding the corners here. Um, when it comes to the, the, uh, the governance of the, uh, the district, I know, um, uh, Superintendent Watson is the sole governing board member. Looking back historically, one statute doesn't the statute prevent us from having a five member board or a nine member board. Or so does it? Is it only the superintendent specifically that can be the governing body of this district? or school, yes. Uh, supervisor, or sorry, Chairman Hickman, Supervisor Gallardo, the statute talks about the county school superintendent being the sole governing board member of an accommodation district, but um, we know from history that um, other school county school superintendents have brought in um, advisory groups um, to kind of assist and advise um, on the accommodation school district. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Leanne. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, moving on, we'd like to talk about um, what we see as a fairly significant history of poor financial management with the district dating back to at least 2018. Um, so it's important to know that school districts are subject to several different types of audits, um, depending on the size of their budget. So they have to do an annual financial audit. Depending on the amount of federal grants they receive, they may also have to do what we call a single audit or a federal audit. And then they have to provide a compliance questionnaire, a USFR compliance questionnaire. So USFR stands for Uniform System of Financial Records. Um, this is the accounting and financial uh, reporting manual established for Arizona school districts. And so that questionnaire is completed by the district's independent audit firm that they hire on an annual basis, and it's submitted in conjunction with their financial audit. So you can see the list of items here um, dating back to 2018. Those that are bullet pointed are items where uh, the auditors have identified instances of non-compliance with USFR. So those are, I would say, generally less serious than the other audit findings I'll talk about in a minute. You'll see in uh, 2018, there were 18 instances. In 2019, there were 10. 2020, there were 15. 2021, there were nine. And these could be for a variety of things, uh, such as miscoding transactions. It could be a lack of receipts or purchase orders or invoices. It could be missing signatures. So it is not uncommon for school districts to have uh, areas of noncompliance and then strive to fix those in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, what is of greater concern to us are the items that have uh, red arrows next to them. So these represent audit findings um, that are material weaknesses. Um, and just as a kind of a frame of reference, a material weakness is when one or more internal controls is deemed by an auditor to be ineffective. Um, 
So if there is a material weakness and ineffective internal control, what that could result in, it doesn't mean it shall or it will, but it could result in a material misstatement in their financial statements. That would make the financial statements um, unreliable and ineffective for assessing financial health. So we at the county, if, when and if we receive a, a, a material weakness in our audit finding, we strive to fix those issues absolutely immediately, and frankly, we strive to not have them to begin with. You'll see dating back to 2018, there were uh, two material weaknesses identified, one uh, related to segregation of duties, uh, the other related to a failure to provide bank statements and perform bank re reconciliations. In 2019 and in 2020, uh, negative cash balances at year end were identified in three of their cash controlled funds. Uh, in 2020, they had to reissue their audit due to unreported federal funds. Um, they had an underreporting of federal funds and a late audit submission. And then just for 2022, we should have that audit already. Our understanding is that had it, the issuance of that audit is being held up by the Auditor General's office as they are undergoing uh, some kind of a, a deeper review of those documents. Thank you. In uh, 2021, the board hired a management consulting firm to take a look at the district um, as there were requests at that time for county general funds. Um, I'm gonna highlight a number of their findings here. And so first, related to cost of services, the consultant found that as enrollment and funding declined, expenditures did not. And so in fiscal year 2019, the cost per student was just over $5,000. And in fiscal year 20, just a year later, that cost was over $26,000 per student. The consultants did a comparison against um, other accommodation districts in uh, Arizona, as well as traditional school districts, and found that the accommodation school district's cost per student were significantly higher than both of those comparisons. Um, and just kind of another more specific area of spending that the, um, the consultants brought to our attention, state formula funding uh, allowed for a 20% salary increase for teachers over a four-year time horizon, fiscal year 2018 to 2021. Within the accommodation districts, uh, teacher salary increases over that same four-year horizon increased by 85%. Leanne, just a quick question, um, FY19 at 5,000, FY20, at 26,000, is that pre-pandemic numbers or is this during the pandemic as well? Uh, Mr. Chairman, so fiscal year 20 would have ended at the, ta at the beginning of the pandemic. So June 30th of 2020 okay. was the end of that year. Okay. The management, the same management um, analysis also looked at financial practices of the district. Um, so uh, some of the concerns noted there, the accommodation school budget exceeded available resources and that had been occurring since fiscal year 2020 and we believe is ongoing. Um, this is due in part to budgets that were developed based on an expenditure level that included a small school adjustment. So a small school adjustment is provided or allowed for a school district to incorporate it into their budget if they have an ADM, I believe it's of less than 125. It gives them additional budget authority. It does not provide additional state funding. So a traditional district would levy a tax to make up the difference between those two. The accommodation district does not have a uh, tax levying ability. Um, the consultant noted that district staff did not appear to be aware that this difference was not funded by the state. Um, budget forms submitted to the state further identified carry forward funding, but there was no cash behind it. So basically a delta between the budget level from the prior year and what was spent would result in a positive, but there wasn't cash behind it, but they were still looking to carry forward that into the new budget year. Um, and they also identified at that time, and this will be come up later when Cindy talks in more depth about audit findings, that the setup for juvenile detention education was not in line with any statute and funds were commingled. Um, so I don't want to go into a, a ton of detail here, but I think it's important to understand there are a couple different ways in which to fund juvenile detention education. One, if it's being handled through an accommodation district, they get counted basically within that ADM calculation as any traditional school district would. There is an 
alternate method for funding juvenile detention education, not through an accommodation district. That funding formula gives you a base amount of $100,000 plus a, a basically a per pupil funding. It is a little bit less rich of a funding source, but it is an alternative that's available. Um, when the uh, county school superintendent, um, we believe in 2020, um, uh, changed the funding formula for juvenile detention education to not to be through the accommodation district, but outside of it, that brought the ADM of the district down to that small school level and could take that small school adjustment. So we think that's the timing that occurred there. Um, it is important to note that the while well, the county school superintendent requested a new fund to be created within the county, at the time it wasn't explained to us what had happened with juvenile detention education. So we weren't we didn't understand why there needed to be a new fund that was not made uh, clear to us. And I think um, even more important to note to note is the absence of a discrete county fund doesn't prohibit an organization from being able to keep a separate ledger or account for funds separately. In fact, um, what we understand from um, the district is that there are actually two ledgers, one for the accommodation district, one for juvenile detention education, but, but monies have not been necessarily deposited correctly into those two separate ledgers. Um, and unless there are questions on that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy to talk in more detail about uh, the finances. Uh, good morning again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, going back over um, several years, starting back in 2020, um, and that would have been the first year where detention education was not um, part of the accommodation district, but rather outside of it. We had requests from the county school superintendent's office in 2020 towards the middle to end of the fiscal year. So I want to say um, it was around the February, March time frame where the, um, there was a request brought forward from the county school superintendent's office to increase their special revenue fund budget in order to be able to provide funding from the county school superintendent's special revenue funds to the accommodation district. I think action was taken somewhere close. Okay, that, that seems better, yeah, thanks. Um, somewhere close to, to year end, where there was a budget adjustment provided, which allowed then for funds to be um, provided to the regional school district from the county school superintendent's office, I believe that was about $1.69 million. Um, earlier in the year, however, I think in the February timeframe, the county school superintendent use existing budget authority to be able to uh, provide $400,000 worth of special revenue funds from their superintendent schools budget to the regional school district. In fiscal year 21, um, again, during the year, we had a request for special revenue fund budgets to increase in order to provide resources to the accommodation district or to the accommodation school. Um, by year end, a budget adjustment again was approved to allow them to provide $1.425 million from the special revenue funds to the accommodation district. In fiscal year 22, the county school superintendent made a request during the budget presentation process for $2 million, $2,048,000 um, for the Maricopa County Regional School District for the accommodation school operations. That request was not um, funded as part of the budget. There was funding that was set aside in contingency um, for such a, a a payment. However, that payment was never moved to the county school superintendent's budget. It was never approved as part of the county school superintendent's budget. On June 30th of last year, the board approved funding $2,048,020. So using that contingency money and providing it to the regional school district with the specific purpose of having them pay off their line of credit. The line of credit at that point in time was $1,186,000. So the county provided them the $2,048,000, $1.1, almost $1.2 million of it went to pay the, the line of credit with Chase Bank and the balance actually is deposited into the Maricopa County Regional School District Maintenance and Operations Fund. So they um, had that balance available to them as of June 30th, 2022. Mr. Chair? Bill. Yes, so thank you. Um, just a question on this line of credit. Was this, um, was, was, was the county, was the board or were you in your office made aware of this line of credit before it was requested? Um, from Chase Bank? 
Mr. Chairman and members of the board, so we do not have um, responsibility for that line of credit as far as the county goes. The, the lines of credits for all school districts are um, established through the treasurer's office. So the treasurer's office um, is the entity that makes the arrangement with um, working with the school districts and working with the bank, Chase Bank, in order to establish the line of credits. We, as we started to review the financial information for the accommodation school and our visibility is solely into the treasurer system. So it's really like looking at a bank account. It's not looking at the detailed ledgers. We did see that through looking at that, that there was a line of credit being drawn on for the regional school district and had been drawn on for the past several years. Okay. Um, but in the end, the board ended up approving, paying for the line of credit that had been established and had been drawn upon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Gates, yes. Um, the board approved the funding to provide to the regional school district, which they then used to pay down that line of credit because the balance was due on June 30th. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I will point out, I'm sorry, John. John walked in the auditorium. Our, our county treasurer is, is joining us today as well. So thank you for coming. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, lastly, as of uh, May 12th, so um, about... 10 days ago, the cash balance of the Maricopa County Regional School District Maintenance and Operations Fund was a negative $473,853. This is a very busy slide, so I apologize, um, but it, it's meant to show a trend um, over time. So as you can see, starting back in uh, July of 2019, um, the resources at the Regional School District this is, and again, this is just cash. So it's not really looking at revenues and expenditures. It's really looking at cash coming in and out of their bank account. Um, over, the, over this period of time, the resources have gone up and down, but primarily have stayed below that zero line. Um, so when you look and see in, De um, sorry, in February of 2020 was the first payment that was made under the new funding mechanism for detention education. So that it changed to that alternate funding mechanism that Leanne described at the $100,000 base payment plus the amount per pupil. The first um, insert of that came to the maintenance operations fund of the regional school district as $1.159 million. It got deposited into the, um, in the county treasury side, their maintenance and operations fund. So again, that's where that money landed. When that money came in, it really did boost the county's, or it boost, boosted the maintenance and operations uh, balance up. Not quite above zero, but it did bring it up. One, one thing to remember though, that that amount of money was for a full year. So that was 12 months worth of money. That, that money comes in once a year. Um, so all the items that are in green are the points in time where we're receiving the detention uh, education funding. As I mentioned earlier, about $400,000 was paid from the County School Superintendent Special Revenue Funds to the Regional School District. Um, that was in the March timeframe, so again, that inched the balance up. At the point where the county made the additional payment from the fiscal year 20 Special Revenue Funds of the 1.69 million, that did bring their cash balance in that fund up over zero. Um, and then as we entered into the new school year, the balance again de declined until we got to that next infusion of detention education funding of $958,000. And again, that took that, that's a full year amount, took it up over zero. And then through the year, the balance then declined. So around June 26th, um, the county or the school district, from what we can see looking at the treasurer's records, there were funds that were transferred. So there are several funds that the regional school district has, and they made transfers out of, uh, out of the funds of the classroom site fund, gifts and donations, and other monies fund. So they depleted the cash in those funds, and they increased the cash um, in the maintenance and operations fund in about um, $1.5 million, more or less. That happened right at year end of fiscal year 2021, prior to any payments being made from the county school superintendent special revenue funds. Again, that took them up slightly over zero. And then at the point when the county uh, school superintendent special revenue funds were deposited, that was another $1.4 million. The, budget, uh, the cash resources increased um, accordingly. 
the next infusion, you can see the, the downward trend based on expenditures being paid. The next infusion of detention aid money came uh, 700,000 in the October timeframe of 21. Again, full year's worth of money. Um, then you can see in February of 22, there was a transfer of the exact same amount from the maintenance and operations fund back to the classroom site fund, the gifts and donations fund, and other monies fund. So that's really like sort of money, moving money between your checking and savings accounts, you know, so that, that's, that's the activity that we could see going in and out of the account um, during those periods of time. Um, and then we had um, an infusion here, as we discussed earlier, of the $2 million in order for them to pay down the line of credit. Um, and subsequent to that, there's been several transfers between their um, federal projects funds or gifts and donations funds from those funds into the maintenance and operations fund. Any questions on that? So, Mr. Chair, no? I just, I don't, I, I appreciate that the, the treasurer is here. I don't know if he'd be willing to answer a question on this issue of the line of credit. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, on the line of credit, I think that came up in our office at a time with a little bit of confusion with Chase. So uh, at that point, we had two school districts being denied a line of credit. They were using an assessment tool that wasn't appropriate to, to organizations that have access to a tax base. In other words, they couldn't default on it. And I had several conversations about that. I think you guys opened the line of credit around that same time. I never caught it as a difference until there was talk of them not having the revenue to pay it back. I pointed out to Chase that they do not have access to a tax base. And so that the argument I was making on the other school districts did not apply to them. That's about my only memory of that whole, whole thing. Um, whether we approved it or didn't approve it, I don't have at the tip of my fingers, but if they were doing it, we most likely did. But our assumption was that they had the revenue to pay for it. Uh, you know, so, and, and you might have a better recollection and want to speak to it, but to us it wasn't a real problem until it wasn't payable. And, and so we treated it like any other school district as far as needing cre uh, credit line. Those usually, those credit lines are for covering things like the rollover. Uh, you know, the state runs a cycle behind, and so to make up that, they use the cash from these uh, credit lines, and then they pay them back when the rollover is realized. That's usually what they're used for, but in this case, I, I wasn't privy to what they spent there for, and that's the best I can recollect, so, okay? Okay, and great, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, on this next fl slide, we are um, illustrating the cash balances that we were able to obtain from the treasurer system for the regional school district's funds as of May 12th. And then also we just updated this slide for what um, the balances were on May 19th. So the maintenance and operations fund, which is the primary operational fund, it's like the county's general fund would be, um, that was $473,000 negative at May 12th. The, the position actually improved on on the statements or the balances on May 19th to $263,000 negative. Um, the four funds that are uh, illustrated here together, so per statute, those four funds can be looked at collectively before any warrants need to be um, registered. So those four funds at the moment are positive, a um, million dollars at the 512 date and then a million point two at the 519 date. Listed then following that are all the balance of funds that are associated with the regional school district. Um, one to note is the federal projects fund. So that was previously at $2.6 million negative in that same time frame. that same week it grew to $2.9 million negative. Um, we understand that the regional school district is attempting to make a draw on these funds. However, they need access to their financial statements that Leanne um, mentioned earlier are being reviewed more extensively by the Arizona Auditor General's office. So until those statements are available, we understand that they're not going to be able to make a draw um, to improve that position. 
So overall, the funding that was sitting in the, in the Treasury at 512 was $6.3 million, and now it is at $5.8 million. Uh, similar to the previous graph, this is the graph for the federal projects, again, starting back in 2019. Uh, we always expect like a grant fund to be a little bit in the hole because you're, they're generally reimbursement grants, so you spend the money, you make the request for the funds, the funds come in. Um, so you're generally about like one month behind in you know your expenditures versus your revenues. But as you can see, when we get to this, the, the beginning of fiscal year 22, so um, the end of fiscal year 21, there's a there's been a decline um, and very little reimbursements have been received since that point in time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could I make it just a quick comment on the slide that showed the cash balances by fund. Sorry to make you sure, back, Cindy. Sure, you go back. I just want to mention, so statutorily, those four funds, MNO, Capital Outlay, Jason Ways, and Classroom Site Fund are combined in terms um, uh, of making a warrant registration decision. Um, but I think it's important to note that uh, as far as we know, those funds are not transferable between one another. They're not fungible. Um, so for uh, it, while, while it's, it is not uncommon for some reimbursement-based funds to run in deficit, such as a grant fund, to have fund balances that routinely run in deficit over the course of a year or many years um, is a bit concerning. Okay. Okay. So um, related to the county school superintendent's office and the county audit, so as you can recall, um, last year we had an audit finding in the county audit of about $1.7 million associated with one of the grants um, through the county school superintendent's office. We have been, um, we submitted our audit to the federal uh, agency and they've been reviewing this matter. We have not heard back any official management decision from them. We are aware that the county uh, school superintendent's office did receive a letter to close out this grant. However, we have not received any management decision following up on the audit finding and the um, Department of Education is required to provide us such a decision and we've not received that yet. For fiscal year 22, um, on June 12th, I think it is, the Auditor General's going to be coming back to talk about our fiscal year 22 audit. And in that audit, where there were three findings associated with the county school superintendent's office, one dealing with P-cards, the other dealing with this same TIF grant where there was an overdraw, which was subsequently earned because they had sufficient expenses, but at the point that they made the draw, they did not have um, the expenses that were indicated. And then we also had the finding associated with the Juvenile Detention Education Center and where the, the funding for that, because the funding for that was sitting at the accommodation school and it was funded via that alternative funding mechanism. So there was the, um, the finding has to do with the monies being commingled at the accommodation school and not sitting at the county. And just one more comment about, um, about our audits this year, um, the county had eight, you'll hear eight findings overall, three of those were associated with the county school superintendent's office. And lastly, we'll wrap it up with just a quick discussion about juvenile um, detention education because it is of particular, I think, concern and interest um, as I, as I stated before, um, this is a mandated function. Um, we did uh, an internal analysis to determine whether or not state funding would be sufficient to cover the needs of juvenile detention education. And we think under either funding formula, that accommodation district or the alternate method, we do believe the state funding is more than sufficient to cover this function and that county funds are not required to supplement it. Um, so in the, the issue that we have, the concern that we have in, in um, 2020, the county school superintendent, as we understand it, opted to provide services outside of the accommodation district. Um, but then as the revenue came in from that alternate funding source, misclassified that detention education revenue as accommodation district revenue, commingling it in the treasurer system, that resulted in the audit finding that uh, Cindy just referenced. Um, that may require a repayment of funds to the state um, up to an amount of $2.8 million. So 
related to that audit finding, which is a, a big audit finding, um, in order to reconcile it or, or adjust, uh, address it, um, we would really need to go back and recreate financial records back to 2019 to determine which pool of which pool the revenue should go in and the expenses should go in to determine a potential repayment amount. Um, it's unclear if sufficient financial records even exist to complete this task. If it were determined that a repayment to the state is required, um, that would have to come or it should come out of the accommodation district's m and fund as that's where all that money was deposited. But as Cindy mentioned, that fund is in deficit and so there's no source there to repay those funds. The audit language as it stands today indicates that the county may be held responsible. Um, and then lastly, it's our understanding that there has been a, a new decision to now provide the juvenile detention education services through the accommodation district effective July 1st. Um, if the district is not solvent, it runs the risk of it not being able to pay for those services, that mandated service that we care very much about. So we worry about juvenile detention education's uh, future in, um, in this scenario. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Are there any questions at this point? Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation and, and going through this for us. And I wanna thank the uh, superintendent for being here today, along with Mr. Morales. Appreciate you guys being here. And I, I may have some questions for you guys as well, but wanted to start over here. Um, we're getting into some, you know, getting into accounting and things like that, that, that could, could make people's eyes glaze over. But I think it's important that we, that people who are watching the 40, maybe more, maybe we're more now than 40 who are watching can understand this. So um, gonna go into some basics here. So gap, gap accounting, that's something that I think people may have heard of, but what, can you explain to us what, what gap accounting is, what that means? So GAAP refers, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, GAAP refers to generally accepted accounting principles. So those are the guidelines for which the profession works under. So it has um, something like what we call the matching principle is one of the, uh, the principles where you would deposit your resources, you would align your resources and your expenses with one another. Oops, sorry. So whatever amount is coming in to pay for something, you would have the expenses associated with that at the same place in the same fund in the same accounting period happening. And so based upon your evaluation of this, the audits that we've heard about, is the or gap, is gap being used by the county superintendent's office? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Gates, I, uh, there have been instances where gap has not been followed with the county, at least with the county school superintendent's office, where we are aware that resources were deposited in a a fund, but the expenses that for which those resources were to reimburse um, were paid out of a, a different fund. And how long have you been with the county um, in, in this role? In this role, okay. I've been in I've been in this role probably about uh, two and a half years, um, but we've been with the county for twenty plus years. In the in the budget function, right? Yep. Yes. And have you seen other countywide electeds? deviate from gap principles before? Uh, there's one instance that I can think of where there was some, some deviation um, and that would have been, I'm gonna guess 2008-ish to 8-9 um, where they, um, the sheriff's office at the time were spending um, funds from a restricted fund for, and spending them on salaries for people who were doing not work that was allowed under that restricted fund. And what happened in that instance? Um, or, or what action was taken? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, I, I um, lived that, uh, that entire experience. Um, the board took the action of subpoenaing financial records from the sheriff's office. Um, we then reviewed those financial records, really dug in and did uh, um, an audit of sorts, identified um, the level of misspending, developed a plan to make sure that the county um, could recoup that. And the money was not spent illegally, it was just spent on a purpose that was not allowed by that fund, developed a plan to essentially repay that fund and put the sheriff's office on a modified line item budget control for a couple years, if I remember correctly. 
And um, Mr. Chair, we've, we've had the discussion of this line of credit. Um, and, and again, I appreciate the treasurer coming up to shine a little bit of light on it. Do you know, Cindy, what assets the um, county superintendent's office uh, essentially used as collateral for the, the line of credit that was provided by Chase Bank? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, I do not know what specifically the regional school district um, indicated as their assets. Okay. I was not involved in the discussions directly with Chase Bank. Okay. But school, so a school district, and, and again, with your experience in this, and if you don't know the answer, that's fine. Um, what school districts or what type of school districts are allowed legally to uh, request a line of credit? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, I believe um, when the lines of credit are requested from the bank, the school district needs to identify what resources might be available to repay those lines of credit. So they have the ta uh, they have property taxing authority, so they have the ability to be able to tax in order to be able to generate resources. Um, that is not something the regional school district has available to them. Okay, thank you. Um, So based upon your, again, your expertise and in, in working in this area for, for 20 years, do you believe that we need a, a full, you know, forensic financial accounting, uh, an audit done of the superintendent's office to, to get a handle on the, the current situation? Um. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gates, I believe we need an in-depth audit of the regional school district in order to in, um, address the county's audit finding as it relates to detention education. The monies that are sitting at the Treasury in the maintenance and operations fund and potentially the federal projects funds, the, the revenues and expenses that have been recorded there have been... Um, while there are separate ledgers, we've noted instances at least of revenues that were deposited um, on the ledger of the accommodation district that were really the funds that came in for the detention education. And again, they're commingled in the county treasury, so we have to sort of tease that all apart so we can understand this is the amount of money that came in for detention education from the state. Here's how those resources were spent, spent appropriately, because the, the kids all got educated. We know that. So there were re the resources were spent on the educating those kids. We just have to determine how much and then determine if there was a delta. And if there was a delta, if there's a remaining balance, what is that? And will it need to be repaid to the state or some other action? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I just had a couple questions for the school superintendent, if well, that would be okay. Let's, um, let's call him up. Okay, if you, unless there's any questions for Cindy and, and Leanne right now. No, but can they stay? Yeah, uh, I, I would request you guys stay because there might be questions that we would ask the superintendent or his financial staffers and, and you guys would then correspond, you know, to ask, answer the same questions. So, uh, or this is a full bore, you know, question and answer session. I. I uh, uh, let's call uh, Mr. Watson. Who who would you like to have sitting at the table? Uh, you want to take the podium and put two people up at the table? Would your the choice is yours? Uh, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Whatever you want to, whatever you'd like to do. Okay. Um, so, S Steve, thank you for coming. You know, on our at our last formal meeting, uh, we talked about some things, and I in invited you. Uh, to come and make a presentation uh, and to answer questions, and you said absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why we are here today. Um, I also asked, can we please just can we make it fast? We're in budget. We're in budget times. You got you. Sure. Thank you for joining us as we went through uh, the this this year's budget. So it's very important that that we got up to speed quickly. Um, and I wanted to make sure I, my colleagues had the ability uh, to be here too. Um, so thank you. This was as about as fast as we could put this together. And I appreciate your volunteerism uh, to come up and, and speak with us. Would you, would you like to make a presentation first? Uh, yeah, I would like to just okay. share some things. Um, I kind of, uh, m my first exposure to the resolution from last week was 
8 a.m. on Wednesday morning. And so uh, I didn't have a, a great deal of time to be able to go through um, just everything that was stated there. And I have some comments regarding um, just talking to some of these issues. Some of my comments at this, at this time will reflect uh, some of the concerns here. And, and uh, I feel a little bit about, I feel a little bit about um, uh, somebody who's grilling in their backyard, right? And um, the neighbor sees the smoke coming up and decides to call the fire department. And uh, the fire department comes to my house and runs out in the backyard and finds me grilling. And uh, I, I feel a little bit like that grill, uh, that grill master. And we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll let you decide who's the fire department, who's the, who's the neighbor. But I feel like if we could have had some conversations prior to this point, um, it would have really helped us all. And to that, uh, I'll, I'll just share a few things. So in the resolution, it was uh, stated that the district has failed to demonstrate that it has funds avail available for fiscal year 2022 and 2023, or 2023 and 2024 that will meet its anticipated expenditures. Um, the district has the necessary cash to fulfill its financial obligations for the 2022-23 school year. Additionally, the district is currently building a budget for the 23-24 school year under the assumption that again, that again the Board of Supervisors will choose not to support the instruction of our students through the allocation of county funds. Um, according to the county treasurer, uh, the Board of Supervisors asked him to keep tabs on the accommodation school finances. Uh, the county treasurer, unbeknownst to the county superintendent, uh, tried, and in my opinion unsuccessfully, to determine the solvency of the district based so solely on money and accounts at the treasurer's office. The treasurer spoke with an agent of the Board of Supervisors indicating the accommodation school doesn't have the necessary funds. The Board of Supervisors then approved the resolution based on what I feel is incorrect information. And it was only after the resolution did the treasurer reach out to representatives of the accommodation school to ask where to find basic budget documents, uh, such as our budget and annual financial reports. Uh, the treasurer's analysis was not do done using, using current budget documents. As a result, uh, I feel like the, the treasurer misreported information to the Board of Supervisors. And the Board of Supervisors accepted that misinformation as accurate without conferring with the county school superintendent. Um, another allegation that was made is the district sold real property in 2022, but has failed to promptly deposit the monies received into a school plant fund required by Arizona Revised Statutes 151102. <laughs> Funds from the sale of the property owned by Maricopa County Regional School District were deposited promptly following the sale with the Maricopa County Treasurer's Office. Via wire transfer on September 22nd, 2022, at no time were the funds held in any other bank account. Uh, the regional school district accounted for this revenue in Fund 500, School Plant, and the corresponding Mar Maricopa Treasurer's Office, Fund 002, other monies. So in our documentation, it was in the, in the right location there. The Arizona Auditor General's Office of Uniform System of Financial Reports defines fu fu Fund 500, Plant Fund, as monies received from the sale or lease or uh, condemnation of school property and used as specified in statute. Cons consultation with the district's audits firm, CWDL, confirmed that Fund 500 school plant fund and therefore County Fund 002 other monies is the appropriate fund for the deposit. Um, it was recommended to us by uh, certain individuals that maybe we consider Fund 695 new facilities. Um, it's also sometimes used to put funds in when build purchasing property. Um, um, but that these funds are not from the school. The, the fund, let me skip down here. Additionally, a May 15th email in consultation with Maricopa County Treasurer's Office indicated that the office does not have a fund labeled plant fund. If the regional school district is non-compliant with 151102, which we think we believe we are, so is every school district with funds presently held in USFR Fund 500 School Plant Fund and de on deposit with the treasurer's office. Paragraph 9 stated that a management analysis completed by Heinfeld Meech in May 2021 concluded that the district's teacher starting pay and cost per student were much higher than comparison entities. The Maricopa County Regional School District teacher contracts starting in fiscal year 20 are for 261 and 262 days. Um, 
Most school districts contract certified staff for 185 to 186 days based on a 180 day school year. When the teacher salaries are broken down to a daily amount, uh, the school district average teacher salary in, 15, in fiscal year 19 uh, for positions that returned in fiscal year 20 was 23% lower than average teacher salary reported by the Auditor General in the fiscal year 19 district spending report. With, fiscal, with the fiscal year 20 salary increases, the Maricopa County Regional School District average teacher salaries, again, only for those who were returning to fiscal year 20, was 3% higher than the state average reported by the fiscal year 20 Auditor General District Spending Report, um, assuming a 186-day contract. Stipend or addendum payments were also limited in fiscal year 20 with the increase to teacher base pay. In paragraph eight, the resolution stated a management analysis completed by Heinfeld Meech in May of 2021 concluded that the cost structure of the district was not sustainable due to declining average daily membership without a concurrent reduction in expenditures. Since that two-year-old management analysis, the district has made several structural changes, including but not limited to closing a school and reducing associated staff. Modest additional support from the county budget would also assist in providing significant supports for students to make sustainability e easier. Um, on April, paragraph 11, on April 18, 2023, the Auditor General notified the Governing Board of the District, which consists only of the superintendent, that the district was in non-compliance with Arizona Revised Statute 15914 and USFR due to failure to submit audited financial statements and reports within nine months of the fiscal end. Every year per state statute, every school district undergoes an audit from a third party independent auditing firm. And that information is submitted to, submitted to the Auditor General. The Maricopa County Regional School District contracted with independent auditing firm CWDL to complete the required financial audit, financial audit for fiscal year 2022. The audit process began in February of 2023. CWDL co completed all the work and submitted the audited fi files to the Auditor General. The Auditor General's office has held finalizing the audits and continues to ask CWDL for additional information. CWDL was scheduled to meet with the Auditor General's office on May 18th, 2023. Because the single audit has not been finalized or uploaded to ADE's grant management's enterprise system, the district had been on financial financial hold placed on it, had a financial hold placed on its grants, um, which caused us not to be able to submit drawdowns or reimbursements, further complicating the concerns in paragraph seven, uh, paragraph seven and paragraph 13. The contracted auditor has indicated in multiple instances that the additional information and documents requested are driven by political issues. Uh, paragraph seven, the district continues to increase deficits in several of its major funds, including maintenance and operations, federal projects, and E-rate. In reality, maintenance and operations, E-rate, have seen reduced deficits since the start of the school year. m and uh, started uh, with, with a deficit, and it's gone down, and I'm happy to share these, these numbers with you as well. E-rate, following the same pattern. Federal grants is a reimbursement fund and it is not uncommon for a school district to have a negative cash balance in this fund. Um, once again, Mer uh, the regional school district cannot currently complete a drawdown of these expended funds from the AD grants management system because of uh, uh, a financial hold as a result of the Auditor General continuing, uh, having not accepted the single audit report completed uh, by independent auditing firm CWDL. Um, uh, in uh, commenting on this, this commingling of funds uh, between the, um, the accommodation school and juvenile detention, um, the, uh, I did, uh, the county school superintendent, our office has uh, con consistently requested that that fund uh, be separate and separated out for juvenile detention. And we've just struggled to make it happen. Um, I don't know if it's a, a political conversation or, or what some of the conversations have been around being able to get that fund created um, because we, we wanted it to, to function that way. Um, per state statute, the accommodation uh, school does not actually have a governing board, but the county superintendent. The county superintendent does have similar responsibilities as a governing board. Um, and uh, specifically in statutes where it talks about responsibilities of a governing board, it, so, most times it, it specifically mentions separately the county school superintendent. Um, 
Uh, also in 15302, it says a county school superintendent may establish an advisory committee to the office of the county school superintendent. Note that this does not give any legal authority to govern the accommodation school to the advisory board. However, to allay any concerns by the board of supervisors, I have at multiple times offered to create an advisory board and asked members of the board of supervisors to work with me to identify people to serve on the board. Um, that request has yet to be fulfilled. Um, in paragraph four, the Arizona Auditor General recently advised county and school superintendent management that the county superintendent's office risks having to return as much as 2.8 million in juvenile detention center education monies to the Arizona Department of Education due to the office's failure to accurately report program operations. Fiscal year 20, 21, 22, and 23, juvenile detention education was funded per Arizona revised statute, variable amount in 15913 no separate account was created at the county level all funds were deposited within the regional school district's county treasurer's account two separate ERP systems school ERP pro and visions are maintained to track revenue and expenses a journal entry is completed in fiscal year 20 and 22 to move the funds from the regional school district school ERP pro to detention ERP pro the transaction was not complete in fiscal year 21. The funds for fiscal year 23 were deposited into the regional school district's county treasure account on October 22nd, but the district has yet to reconcile or post those funds to the ERP Pro. Uh, in Arizona Revised Statute 15913, if a county chooses not to operate its juvenile detention center education program through an existing accommodation school, the county school superintendent may establish a detention center education fund to provide financial support to the program. The detention center education fund for each program shall consist of a base amount plus a variable amount. Um, just a, a little bit uh, more uh, on that particular topic. Uh, one of the reasons why we did pull out, and, and I would actually say we ha had this conversation with county management ongoing, um, one of the reasons why we separated, um, worked to separate the two accounts, juvenile detention from the accommodation school, is, is we did sense a certain hostility around the accommodation school, and that we might not be able to continue to operate that uh, moving forward. And so we wanted to make sure that there was no, um, there was no, um, pause in juvenile detention uh, supports for, for our school as we were negotiating and trying to have some conversations around the accommodation school. And so um, you have let me know through various uh, personnel in the county that you want them to go back together. And if that is, is how we, we want to do that, that is fine. Um, I am happy either creating an account separate for juvenile detention and maintaining that that way, or going back to having the, um, uh, the juvenile detention operate as part of uh, the juvenile or as the accommodation school. Um, I, I'm nearing the end here and I appreciate your patience. Um, there have been ongoing concerns with the financial mismanagement of the district with less than one year ago resulted, which less than one year ago resulted in the County Board of Supervisors having to appropriate over two million to cover the district's line of credit. There was no mismanagement. The budget was purposely built with the understanding that dollars would become available from the county. The funds were approved in fiscal year 2022, Maricopa County budget in contingency. There was an agreement between the Board of Supervisors, Chair then Chairman Jack Sellers and County Superintendent Steve Watson that the funds would be moved from contingency upon completion of an audit. There were no additional stipulations. Superintendent Watson requested that the audit be performed per the agreement so that the money would be released. For reasons unknown, an audit it was delayed. Superintendent Watson, me, I met with Chair then Chairman Bill Gates, who indicated that $2 million to support the operation of two school, then two schools, uh, now we only have one, and a juvenile detention seemed reasonable and would work with the county to move forward. Um, and then lastly, regarding uh, paragraph 10, the district's uniform system of financial records for the Arizona School District's compliance questionnaires have reported numerous instances of non-compliance, including material weakness over the last several years. The accommodation school is always working on corrective action to correct any material weaknesses. And I think we saw that in one of the slides. As, as for fiscal year, uh, the current fiscal years, um, we have eliminated those, those red arrows uh, moving forward. And we are always trying to do that, as is um, every responsible government entity and every school district in, in Maricopa County. And so I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions, take some questions. 
Um, I also have Heather, who is my new chief financial officer, Heather Mock. I really appreciate her skill and expertise and my chief deputy, uh, Matt Morales, as well. And then also, I'd be remiss not to recognize Adrian de Alba, who um, is a teacher leader at uh, Hope, our accommodation school, and also has been helping. Uh, he has been uh, on a crash course these last few months to become an expert in school finances. We try to honestly uh, work with the county and uh, resolve any concerns and issues that, that we may have. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let me just say thank you for, uh, we had a presentation by our budget group, and thank you for, you know, listening. And I hope you understand we're listening too. So uh, so thank you for all of us being polite to each other as Absolutely. we dig a, a little bit into this, because sure. I'm certain, my, my a quick question I have is, you have this report and numbers and transactions, um, and you, you might, you know, our view, your view, there, there might be things on here that jump to your attention that you feel like, oh, that, that's not true. But let me, let me just ask, do you have a problem with any of the numbers part? Do you see some numbers that, I mean, these are numbers that we had to research and get to a point where we can just put something down on black and white. Maybe that's a good question for you, Heather. Um, you got a chance to take a look at this and these numbers. Does some of these numbers not jive? You're, you're probably digging into a time frame, transactional things. Um, do you, do you have a problem with any of the numbers that, that you see here? Um, Chairman Hickman, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I've had a bit of a crash course in uh, Maricopa County Regional School District financials over the last week. So I don't know that I am the um, expert in the material at this time. <clears throat> Uh, we have been working with Ms. Hansen as well to look into this as these questions have come up. Um, I've seen the only thing that I, I'm not sure that are the same or what I'm seeing um, or for some of the cash balances that were reported. A lot of um, the monies as far as what the Board of Supervisors approved previously for the school district, uh, I've been able to find that back up, but um, I don't have the current treasurer's reports. I can see the end of month balances for the school districts from month to month. And I just know that what I'm seeing in the regional um, school ERP Pro or the iVision software is showing a different um, cash balance for maintenance and operations presently. So that's the only one that I'm not sure of. Okay, let me ask Tom. Mr. Chairman, I have yes. a quick question for the superintendent. Thank you for your statement. If you haven't already, could you please provide that to us in writing just so I can have it for review absolutely. and consideration? Yep, Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Um, Matt, do you have uh, concerns with numbers that, that were presented by our budget? You've, you've worked in this space a little bit since you guys have had some uh, people leave the audience let, let, or the... the um, Agency, do you, do you have a problem with some of these these dates, time frames, and numbers that you can see? Um, I have. I took over at, in the capacity of CFO of funding transfer in uh, the fall of 2020, or, uh, up until when uh, Heather Mock came with us. My focus as chief deputy is in the CSS portion of the numbers, not in the Maricopa County Regional School District. Mm -hmm. I'm not the business manager for the. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Could you hear me though? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my work is primarily in the county superintendent's office on that side of the budget, not in the, as the business manager of the Maricopa County Regional School District. Those are separate entities, and I always made sure to keep my, my work on the side of the county finance and county budget. Um, as a review of those numbers that have to do with juvenile detention education and the county, uh, I agree. Uh, there were several budget cycles where I myself was requesting the separation of the juvenile detention ed. Uh, and at the time, I did my best to explain that it was a management issue. As a, a chief deputy, uh, for me to be able to see where the money's at, I need to be able to see what the, of the budget that I can see into. And I cannot see into the, the accommodation school district, much like the numbers that, that Cindy, excuse me, Ms. Geltz, sorry, mm -hmm. was looking into as well. Um, she's been very helpful to me over the past several months as becoming better 
at county finance, and those are the numbers that I focus on. So for the reason that I had asked in years past was so that I could see the, the amount come in from the county, and then where it moved over correctly so that we could uh, continue to do juvenile detention ed. In past years, though, I have not seen an issue because I, from the juvenile detention ed side, there has been no comment as to the level of education being provided. They were very happy, very excited to continue the relationship. Therefore, I said the, the funds have been, must have been using well because the services are being provided to the level of the customer satisfaction. Okay, let's, let's stop for that okay. and that one right now because there's some, you know, some names came up, okay? Um, Treasurer Allen's here and his name was brought up, your name was brought up. Um, so Treasurer Allen, I don't know if you wanted to make any clarifying statements uh, as we as we go further into some questions. Thanks. So just to clarify a few things, um, first of all, the board never approached me or gave me any instructions. Uh, you guys had the resolution on, on a couple weeks ago. We had discussions uh, about this long before then. The audit, state audit, is really what eventually brought this up to you know, DEPCON 4 with us, you know, the reasons why we wanted to look into the into this situation. Internally, we have, you know, first of all, the, the treasurer's office, our main job is not legal or illegal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes it's not even appropriate or inappropriate. It's solvent or insolvent. And so we could not follow the line of logic of where the school, uh, the county schools were appropriating and spending and accounting for all their monies and whether we could say that they are going to be solvent in the near future. And so we started asking those questions internally. Uh, in very late April, I had a meeting on another subject, but uh, your chief of staff was there and the county uh, uh, manager was there. And I, I mentioned them, I, we, we, we had the room of other people leave, uh, but we had just a quick two minute conversation saying, I'm looking into these things because I can't draw a line myself and my people between what they have coming in and what they have going out. You guys then had your thing with the resolution on it, which named me, didn't give me any extra powers when I was going about my things. I met with the uh, state school superintendent's staff to, uh, right after that meeting, had a conversation of what type of appropriate questions were to be asked and stuff that. Then we met with the county uh, uh, superintendent. That meeting, I think, ended very well, uh, contrary to the, some of the statements you made, because mm -hmm. I, I, I truly explained to you then, too, that this is, this is a, a process I'm driving. Uh, this is my investigation of what, whether um, I should give you more money. And so that's where my position is on some of your comments. But I think we ended in a good place. They agreed to meet with ourselves, the state school, school superintendent, finance, and we're gonna sit down and, and, and I hope we continue on that path. Because what, what I'm holding out is that we, we are able to understand where they are financially and that we don't have to go to a warrant system uh, where, where we register warrants, where then they will be, we will be putting out money, basically IOUs which is an untenable thing in a school district. So uh, there's, there's a lots of work to be done yet. There's a lot of things to understand. But the, the audit showed creative use of, of county refund, re resources that I was uncomfortable with if this was the same methods being used in other areas. And that's when the red flags really went up for me. The explanations from the county superintendent have been reasonable, but not in a way that I can actually prove or disprove my, my overall premises. So that's why we're taking it to the next level, where we're bringing in subject ex experts from the state school superintendent's offices, people with a little bit of understanding of where the money goes and comes and goes in a more macro sense, and then the micro sense of which my office does. And so we're in, we're in a process. It's separate from what you guys are doing. and and neither of them will interfere with the other. My job is to make sure that I have the money that, that is available to, to pay the bills in which they are expected to pay, and if I don't, that I have a reasonable expect, explanation of why I'm doing the things I'm doing. And so that's where the treasurer's office is at. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, have a seat. Don't it, uh -huh. And stay close. Okay. Um, 
so you, <laughs> our budget office just heard some things. Would you like to make any clarifying remarks or statements? Um, yes, and, and not, not to get into kind of a, a rebuttal basis, but just as a point of clarification, um, just maybe we can go back a few slides here. Um, with regard to teacher salaries, I think that's a good place to start. Um, the uh, management an analysis did not look at number of days of education provided. It looked at whether or not the district had the resources to pay for its expenses. So really, re regardless, I, I, that n nothing about um, the, how, how many days teachers teach, uh, but you can only pay for, for what you can pay for. Um, so th what this says is the costs went up, and they went up in a way that revenues were not coming in to support them. It also says that the uh, pay increases went up at a pace that was not covered by the state funding formula. So those are the points there. It was and, and certainly no indictment on the, the programs or the, the amount that the teachers teach or their dedication at all. Um, I'd also like to mention on the, the M&O fund, because that is the fund that we focus on the most. Um, looking at this trend, um, Superintendent Watson mentioned that in the, in the current fiscal year, they've improved their cash, cash position. But I'd like to point out the improvement in their cash position was really fueled by the $2 million that the county board provided to pay off the line of credit, but also the additional $800,000 that was deposited. So you see the lowest point um, that's about three quarters of the way over to the right on the slide, that lowest point that goes back up, that's your infusion of $2 million. So had that not occurred, that you can just drop that entire trend down by $2 million and it would be um, the worst position yet in I think the history of the district. Similarly with the, the federal trend, um, as we understand it, there's not an ability to draw it on right now because those audit findings are being held up by the Auditor General's office. That's current year, that's just over the last few months, but that doesn't explain the precipitous decline that we've seen over the last two years. So you'll see about halfway through this slide that really steep decline, that's over the last two years. So we don't have an explanation for what would have happened last f fiscal year with an inability to draw down on uh, federal grants. Um, and then the, the last point that I would just like to make, and perhaps Cindy has other points too, is I'm not sure which county staff um, the superintendent was referring to with regard to recombining juvenile detention education in the accommodation district uh, that I, I don't know of any county staff that were advising in that fashion because frankly, it's not our role to advise. It's our, our role to inform the board if we have concerns. Um, and Cindy, I'm not sure if you have anything to add. Thank you, Leanne. Um, yeah, no, I, I think we did the analysis on whether or not there would be sufficient funding um, to operate detention ed either through the ADM methodology or through the 15913 methodology. So we had a conclusion there that it is likely more favorable financially to have it go through the ADM, so in essence to combine them back, but that wasn't a recommendation on how to operate it. It was just the financial, the, the conclusion of the financial analysis. Okay. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, you know, before I did, oh, yeah, you know, sure. I said, Jack, um, you know, I said there was some people's names that were mentioned. Jack, did you want, did you want to say anything? Well, let me, let me just comment briefly that when we were asked for additional funds while I was chairman. And uh, thank I you, by the way. Pardon? And thank you, by the way. Uh, we didn't feel that, that we had been given enough information to decide whether or not the funds were going to be adequately uh, directed or justified. So to resolve that issue, I asked to have the funds put into contingency while we address those issues. Got it. You did mention it was put in contingency under your, under your chairmanship and we had a couple more meetings and we saw this line change. change. Looks looks better, but it was a cash infusion, right? We got understood? Yes. Okay, Bill. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a follow up to that, my name was mentioned yeah. as well. And again, we, we and, and this is, I just, I just wanna have a, you know, I wanna have a very open discussion about this because I think it's important. First of all, let me be clear. I do not question your commitment to the kids of Maricopa County 
uh, in any way. I think your heart is in the right place. I think you're doing great work. So this has nothing to do with your job as superintendent as it relates to educating the children of this county. So I think we can just take that off the table. At the same time, I think we should also take off the table any suggestion that this board is hostile because that, I, I wrote down a few, those one of the things, hostility to the accommodation school. Uh, if we've given you that impression, let me make it clear. This board is supportive of what you're doing with kids. This board has, is, we uh, are involved in Head Start. Uh, so, so let's kind of take that off the table. We're looking simply at our responsibility, our fiscal responsibility as fiscal stewards. That's what this is all about. And there was also, you made the comment if we could have had some conversations. You know, frankly, we've had a lot of conversations. We had conversations when I was chair. We weren't able to get where we wanted to get to, and that was a shame. What I asked for to get my support, and again, I'm just one member up here uh, on the board, so I don't speak for the rest of the board and, you know, vice versa. But what I was looking for was an audit, was commitment to a full forensic financial audit um, before I was in a position to be comfortable to, to funding moving forward, and we weren't able to get there. Um, and I don't really understand why, but just to be clear, I didn't, but, but there was a suggestion that maybe I made a commitment and I reneged on it. I would push back on that. That's not how I remembered it. So again, that's, I, I just wanted to clear up on those things. But this line of credit, I, I just really wanna get some more transparency on that. So I don't know if there's someone on your side who can answer what, what you know, collateral was presented you know, to support this because you don't have taxing authority, right? As the, that is, as cor that is okay. correct, yes. So that, that would help me a lot in understanding that. So I don't know what you know, your, your response is yeah, to that uh, question. You know, to, that, to that question, I think the person to, to best answer that question isn't here today and is not an employee of Maricopa County. And um, we would have to have that conversation with him uh, to be able to identify uh, what was used in, in that place. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the candor. I mean, again, for me, what I'm looking for as one member of this board is, hey, can we work together moving forward? Can you guys agree to this full forensic financial audit so that we can have that transparency? And then frankly, have this board get the comfort level sure. so that we can continue to support your efforts, which are admirable uh, moving forward. I am absolutely comfortable working with the Board of Supervisors, County Management, the Treasurer's Office, thank you, um, to do any audit needed to demonstrate the, where the money is being spent and how it is being spent. And I, I believe that it will be accounted for. Uh, and it will be demonstrated that every dollar was spent towards the educating um, of our students in an appropriate way. Um, and, and I guess my, my, my frustration leading up to this point has just been just a struggle to be able to uh, f feel like we are um, moving forward together. Um, you and I in our early conversations always talked about, hey, how do we, how do we be partners? How do we move forward? Uh, you, you've, you've talked, and I think appropriately so. Uh, we want to help you, but if I'm going to do any investment in a business or go into business with anyone, we want to make sure that their financial ducks are in a row and other things. And I, I guess my frustration leading up to this point has been uh, the conversations about my office without anybody from my office involved in the conversations so that we can work towards this transparency and so that we can uh, move forward in, in educating the kids in the county and juvenile detention and the accommodation school. Well, let me let me try to um, figure this one out uh, when it comes to communication. You guys have had some changes in in your office. We have, right? Especially when it comes to the financial. Absolutely. And then we also uh, was was gratified at one point uh, because our county office was helping. You know. Uh, you, you Vicky, guys, you Vicky guys Hansen, um, she was mentioned in the budget presentation, has been indispensable. Okay. And working with our office, um, especially while we were without a chief financial officer, phenomenal. And um, with uh, 
County Manager, I think, uh, Jen, if you want to say something about communication, um, I've certainly kind of put the shoulder into you and your staff. Um, you're, you're, you're new in the role, uh, but you've been involved with this, I believe. So if you could just talk about communication, because we, we've been very receptive, I think, I, I think. Yes, thank you, Chairman. And we, you know, as you mentioned, we, we do have an employee there that is uh, acts as a liaison and helps. And I know Cindy and her team during the budget cycle have had meetings with Matt and before that Mark, and I have also had meetings. So we, we appreciate Matt and others meeting with, with your office and we feel that the communication has been, um, we have has been open and regular and frequent. So if there is something else that we could be doing, we would be happy to. But from my perspective, it seems like that we've been communicating regularly about the issues. Thank you, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, some of that has occurred. In most recent days, once again, um, I, I was not aware that there was even going to be um, a resolution on the table until eight o'clock of the morning of the resolution. It wasn't on the draft uh, agendas, as far as I'm aware. And um, just some of those conversations leading up to that point, I think, do illustrate that there are conversations going on about the status of uh, the accommodation school in the county superintendent's office without um, my representatives in the room. Well, S Steve, did you not f did you not feel that you heard the board of high concern with that state audit report that, that we've that we've had a very large concern and have tried to reach out and give you guys the ability to come and work with us? I mean that that's when the state auditor general is getting some bad findings. Uh, towards some issues. I mean, it, it, it certainly made me stand up and take notice. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I agree with you. I stood up and took notice. And, and I actually, I feel like the Auditor General finding is more of a, an example of just some of the challenges that we've had as we have requested. Uh, a, a lot of the issue was this account was not created um, at the Treasurer's Office um, in, in County Finance. And as a result, that forced the commingling of these funds. Not my word, but I'm using someone else's. Uh, but um, we maintain separate ledgers uh, on the school side, um, and we're happy to, to go through that information. And um, that was, in my opinion, and, and I'm obviously defending myself here, I feel like that, um, that finding was, was more of a, a result of, of this ongoing inability to, to find common ground in, in some of these financial things that impact uh, the regional school district and, and the juvenile detention funding. And so um, I, I think it could have been avoided um, with the creation of that, that fund, and we have to decide how we're gonna move forward. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Watson, a question for you. Supervisor Gates brought up the prospect of a forensic audit. Is that something you can commit to being conducted? You know, if, um, if that means uh, people in different colored shirts down at the fairgrounds, then I would be, I would be concerned uh, about that. But if it's working with county finance to identify the movement every dollar, yeah, I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to support that. Okay, thank you. Well, Budget. Mr. Chair, sorry, can I just add on that? But would you be willing to have an outside auditor come in? Um, I, I'm happy to have a conversation with, I, I, I'm not saying no, uh, I'm not an auditor by trade. Uh, I have little to no experience in audits. We'd have to have a conversation of how to best move forward. I'm not categorically yes or no. Um, if that's what we agree to, then I'm comfortable with that. Let me ask, so Mr. Allen, would that help you? Here you, here you stand as county elected officials uh, protecting taxpayer money. Would that make you uh, feel a little more comfortable? I think in the long run, we, we have to do that. But in the short run, I think we need to have the combined meetings of several offices because he has a school to run and we have pay issues coming up on a monthly basis. So yes, I think, I think in the long run, we need to have a, a, a forensic audit where we sort of go, here's really how these monies are supposed to be divided. Here's the accounting streams. You know, and, and what does that model look like over what we're doing and for the long run so that we don't land up here every two years? 
short run, I need to sit down with stakeholders and go through the process to find out is the money appropriately placed and do they have the cash resources they need in the short run. That's my biggest concern as the treasurer right now. I don't want to have to do anything else but pay the bills. Well, and and, and John, I, I hear you, and I it, you weren't here during our budget presentation, but the county has a lot to think about, lots of agencies lot that we have to hit, hit the ground running and, and make sure we're not skipping gears or outright missing roads and turnoffs. So um, with the budget department, would, it, would that, what is, how is that? How do you view this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we um, we would benefit most in addressing the county's audit finding that we're gonna hear about on June 12th related to the detention education funding. We would benefit most by having an outside firm come in and do an in-depth analysis of all the revenues and expenses and balances, assets, liabilities, fund balances, at the regional school district so we can determine how much money was appropriate or was received by the regional school district that was for the detention education component and were those resources and expenditures properly aligned versus the operation of Esperanza and Hope and were those resources properly aligned and what balances are there. That's really what we need in order to be able to address the county's audit finding. Thank you, Cindy. I stepped on Bill. I, Bill, you were were you finished? I'm sorry, I stepped on you and went right over to John. But yeah, no, no, that was that was it. It's just you know exactly what Cindy said. I mean, I feel like that's in everyone's best interest to do it, uh, to get that transparency, and we can be in a position to move forward. Otherwise, you know, I mean, honestly, to have this situation with the line of credit and what we had to do before, that that's not. That's not gap. That's not you know. Uh, th that's not the way we do things in Maricopa County. And so I want to see us all marching forward together. And the way that I can get there is by an outside audit. Tom, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I'm also all about transparency. We all are. Um, I'm seriously concerned about the findings from the Auditor General and what we've been already um, discussed and what's been delivered to us. But I also want to think about timing. If we do something like this, I would love to get the information as fast as possible. I obviously know that there's some timing in something like this, but how soon or what would be the estimated timeline for something like this? Because I'm gravely concerned about what we've been hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gallen, I think um, it would take several months to get through this because really it's going back and having to find the record. Like, I don't know what's available at the regional school district as far as records, support, documentation. All I can see are transactions through, you know, like bank statement transactions. So it's going to take, you know, time for us to get those, identify the auditors, to get them in there, and then depending on the state of the, the accounting records the, um, at the regional school district, that will determine the time frame. But I can't imagine... It, it, it will take several months. Okay, thank you. And do you, do you guys understand the importance that this board feels, uh, just even reading the paper, we assigned, or we asked the Maricopa County Attorney's Office to look into another issue using the best of the best and their independence uh, to look at a, at a separate issue. Um, I, think that, I think that brings value. Maybe not to all, but to most of the, the voters uh, when, it, when it comes to situations like like this, um, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, funds, funds balances, was it spent correctly? Uh, you, you could use, Heather, I'm sorry, but you could use the help too, right? I mean, you're new um, and uh, you're learning about it. I've heard from our budget office, we might have to go back as many as three years, right? When, when we had that possible co-mangling of detention funds and accommodation school district. Maybe, maybe not, whatever, however you view it. Fund, fund this, fund that, but we need to look into it. You also have a school. You also have a school to run. You have an agency to run. Uh, we do too. So um, I would implore you guys to put an audit team together and, and do this as quick as we can because there's you know, there's there's two things. It's it's the auditor general findings. We we need to see how do we get how do we get correct there? Um, much less, uh, much less. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, mm -hmm. I think we need to get there together. I do too. Yep. I do too. And uh, getting there together is, is, is making sure that we have 
pros looking at this all the way through and, and make sure because we, we have served uh, in these roles together. You, you uh, in your agency and, and ours also up here as the budgeting authority. So I would like to get together. With, together we go forward, right? Apart we don't. So um, I think that'll bring the, help us bring the vision. So we, will, we would need a detailed plan as soon as possible. Okay, with your help. Absolutely. With your vision, too. Um, you said that you will willingly participate in an audit. That, that's what I heard today. I, I have been, yes, absolutely, from, from, from day one. Uh, Matt, would you, would you like to say something? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, mm -hmm. which entity will be uh, providing the funding for that audit? <laughs> I guess we need to, uh, let, here's our budget office. Uh, do, do we need to put something in contingency? <laughs> maybe, maybe, what is what is the correct way to proceed? Uh, um, Jen. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, our recommendation would be that we could work jointly on a, um, a scope of work. The county has a number of audit firms already on contract. We would put that out as a bid and then jointly select the correct auditor. Um, given that this is a county audit finding, um, this seems like something that the county budget should probably fund um, because we want to make sure that it's done correctly. The uh, price tag hang, uh, hanging over our heads of $2.8 million um, is much, much greater than what it will cost to perform this audit. Yes, Jen? Okay. Let me ask a question. Um, I don't think I heard this answer. Understanding that the district's annual year-end financial audit was due to the State Department of Education, and you went there, John, in March, and that deadline was missed. Uh, is that audit complete, and when will it be submitted to the state? It, it, has it been? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I am not sure 100 percent when that audit will be complete, if it is at the moment. Um, our our um, third party contractor mm -hmm. finished their audit. They submitted the documents to the Auditor General, who indicated that maybe due to the political nature of our conversations, requested some more information from our, uh, our outside third party auditing firm. And then our auditing firm then came back and has on multiple occasions requested additional, uh, additional information. So that's a little bit up in the air as far as I know at 12.42 p.m. on uh, May 22nd. So I'm sorry. I, I'm Maybe you guys got it. It's flying over my head. The political nature of our conversations. What does that mean? I, I, I'm not entirely sure. Just when we have met with our um, our single our, our district audit done by this thirty par third party contractor should have been done. Um, they did what they do for every school district. Um, they submitted those documents to the auditor general, and then the auditor general. And this is, I'm getting this information from, from our auditor. Uh, the auditor general has then been going back to our auditor requesting additional information. Matt, did you want to add something to that? The clarity is that they, get, they said that to us. We're not saying that about these. Yes, I, that, that was not, those, weren't my, those were not my comments. Those were comments coming from the third party auditor saying, I'm not sure why, they're, well, why they are asking for more information. It seems political in nature. Those weren't my comments. Those were relayed to me by, by an auditor. Mr. Chairman, just really, because I, I was listening earlier, and someone may have stated this. Uh, I, I, get, I, I thought what was, what was told to us right now was the third-party auditor completed the audit, submitted to the State Department of Education. At the same time, this is the way I understand it. Just listen to you all. Sure. The Auditor General then came in, started doing their audit, asking for additional information. But because the Auditor General is asking for additional information, the State Department of Education would not accept your financial reports. Is that not true? Did I hear that wrong? Uh, I thought that's what it was stated. Um, that's the way I understood it. Supervisor Gallardo. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have, before coming to county, I did have 12 years school district financial experience. And the way I'm, I am understanding what happened, um, 
the audit firm CWDL sent their completed work to the Auditor General. It first goes to the Auditor General, and once it is accepted, accepted, they provide the school district with the formal copies of the completed single audit report, um, annual comprehensive financial report, and compliance questionnaire. And the draft forms of those were submitted to the Auditor General. Once those are completed, it is actually the school district that submits the single audit report to uh, the Department of Education via the Grants Management Enterprise System. And so it was that document that the school district was waiting on to upload to the Grants Management Enterprise System. And in absence of that having been completed, that's why there was a temporary financial hold only on their grants. Now, since then, the school district went ahead and uploaded the draft that they were provided. Um, there is a temporary reprieve on that financial hold. So currently, the grant accounts are not marked as having a financial hold. And uh, the school district is hopeful that they will be able to do some of those drawdowns while all of this other stuff is happening in the background, but certainly would upload that final um, single audit report to the grants management enterprise system once they have it. Very good. Thanks, Heather. Any other questions I have? Uh, Cindy, did you, or did you guys have something? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just a point of clarification. Um, I think typically what happens is once the audit gets completed, that's when the audit gets submitted to the state and it goes to the Auditor General for re after the audit's been completed. In this instance, I think the Auditor General has reached out to the district ahead of time, ahead of time. so this there's some uh, actions that are being taken that are not typical um, of the audit process. Okay. Um, let me just, I always, I always like to, well, we always have this big number. I always have this big number. Where's the big number and how can it be spent? So I want to just a point of clarification on other monies. Is this the plant fund then? Is, it, is, this, is this the plant fund? Uh, Mr. Chairman, so there in the county treasury, there is no school plant fund. There is a other monies fund, and that is the fund, again, in the county treasury. So um, the statute says the, when there's proceeds from a sale of a building, the school district will tell the um, county treasurer to put them in the school plant fund. Okay. There is no school, sorry, no school plant fund. So where they were deposited were in a fund called the Other Monies Fund. So again, that's the, in the bank account system, that's the name of the bank account, Other Monies. From what I understand, from what the, the regional school district folks have reported, on their side, in their ledgers, in their accounting systems internal to their school district organization, they were put in a fund called the School Plant Fund. But it was just that the treasury side of it does not have that fund set up. So they were not put there, they were put in the other money. Spot. Is there any statutory callers, you know, where uh, on titles, okay, plant fund, other monies, anything, where money like this can't be spent, can't or cannot be spent in ongoing operations or anything? This is... Um, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding the sale, in specific to school districts, the sale of buildings is some somewhat restricted, it depends on um, when the building got sold. But I think in this instance, it appears that those proceeds must be used for capital items. Okay, we're, we're, we're clear on that. So it can't go to any other or wash out or move in different areas. So that's, that's, a, that's a large amount of money. Yes, sir, Matt. Mr. Chairman, if I may, the reference is to 151102. When a building, this is, I'm giving you this as, as notion for all schools. If a school had a school in a school facilities board, it would then have that money going back into this. This is a school that the land was outside of that because the district predates the school facilities board. The sale happened. It went directly in and didn't, the money didn't go anywhere else. I saw that go in and, I've, and that's the part I've seen of it. Uh, but in that 151102, we'll tell you that the, the money needs to be used to make another purchase of a capital asset, and that when lease or properties go into that same fund, they can only be used mostly, I think for, except for a minor piece, towards, uh, towards capital only. Expenditures made in such a way, and that's for all schools. 
this has this comes up with the district with uh, the county through Giplet, if you've heard the mm -hmm. excise tax, when a school is renting their uh, fields or if they're renting their cafeteria for another school, those taxes come back and that's in that same area. Those monies can only be used for capital outlay. Any questions there? Steve? I have questions, but on a different topic, though. I think we should finish on the financial side first. Well, that's about, that's about, I think we have most of the financial questions asked right now. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Watson, um, or maybe to, to anybody, um, I was Googling all the, uh, I'm more interested in the governance of it. I really am. I mean, it, it really shocked me when I come to find out that, um, that and it, so I probably should have known this, but I didn't, that you were the sole board member. I mean, I, I would love to be the sole board member of the flood control district. Uh, we would have, yeah, or the board of supervisors. We would, we would have no flooding the, uh... in district five, trust me, <laughs> no flooding in district five. Um, but no, I, I, I it just, it just, it, and I was, I cannot find that provision. I looked, I looked both in 15308 and 1510101, 14, None of it, it doesn't state that. It's a, it's a, uh, there has to be another point. I'm not questioning it. I'm, I'm, I would just like to read it. I just don't know where that is. Maybe we can, I see our little lawyer attorney back there. Maybe it's something we can get later, but I can, I did not find it in 308 or 101. But I'd love to read that portion of it because I think the governance is something that I get it. I mean, if I'm take everyone's word for it, it states that exactly, and um, it does. I'm assuming allow for an advisory committee. I didn't read. I haven't found that in statute yet. Um, but that's something maybe, and no, no fault of the of the of the superintendent that. or 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 anyone. It's it's just I don't know the the infamous wisdom of the legislature at the time they drafted that or lack thereof because that really should not be the case in any government. I mean, that's, it's just hard to believe that there's only one person making these types of decisions. Uh, there should be uh, a broader governance, and that's something that the legislature has to deal with. Uh, Mr. Watson, I, I, you stated that you had mentioned the possibility of having an advisory committee um, without any type of legislative change. I think that is really a must if we're going to fund. There has to be other folks engaged in it. I don't know what the role, the actual authority of the advisory committee, but there has to be um, other folks engaged in it. I understand, I'm not too sure if it was um, Dr. Dowling or uh, Dr. Covey that had, uh, maybe it was prior to them even, uh, that had similar uh, 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 advisory type uh, group, but that is definitely a must. Um, at least for me it is. Um, if I am going to vote on any funding to fund the accommodation school, there has to be other folks uh, uh, looking in on this and providing um, recommendation. My question, um, start off, I know, I know we've asked this question before, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask, how many students are currently attending the the accommodation school, just an average. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Gallardo, um, before I answer their question, I, I would just like to talk to the governance uh, component for just one moment. A, a traditional school board um, has some taxing authority. Um, they have access to bonds and overrides. They can, as a board, choose to ask their voters and uh, for, for additional uh, taxes be levied and the voters can make that decision. And I have a board too. It's the board of supervisors. Um, when you compare uh, the accommodation school to a traditional school district, um, you have these, these financial conversations that should happen between the superintendent and 
the, the, the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. You can choose, and I'm not asking for this today, um, uh, you could choose to create a tax levy for the accommodation school. You could choose to give additional dollars through various different ways. And so I, I would actually say that there is a, a, an opportunity to mirror a traditional school district um, where you do have some of those checks and balances, where you have a five-member board helping to make those decisions um, and my board is is you, and uh, I, I just that's how I view it. You may agree or disagree, but I just wanted to be able to share that as just a, a philosophical view of the office of the school. No, and I, I appreciate that, Mr. Watson. I mean, I, as as a governing board member for many years on an elementary and high school governing board, uh, yes, I have a a, uh, a a financial responsibility to the taxpayers of the school district and 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 making those tough decisions. But I, as a school board member, I do much more than that. Yes, absolutely. I do much more uh, in terms of programs, services, hiring staff, all that stuff we're engaged in. Yes. And, and we set the direction. And kudos to all the school board members out there. It's a tough job, very important job, and, uh, and, and uh, they don't get paid to do it. So kudos to all them that are out there doing it. Um, but going back to yes. the, the, the accommodation school, um, that's why, once again, that's why I think having, in terms of governance, there has sure. to be um, others engaged in it. Yes. There really is. And uh, so I would, I would hope to, we would engage that discussion, Mr. Chairman. Um, going back to how many students so, right now? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Gallardo, um, on any given day, we have, Adrian Woods, do you know our numbers roughly today? We gra yeah, but we graduated in uh, some kids. It's about 79 to 85 kids who fluctuate throughout the year. So we have, 70, we have 79 to 80 kids. Uh, we've had a few more than that um, at times. Uh, the kids that we do work with um, can be transient in nature. Um, we just graduated 12 students um, a, a week ago. These are students who honestly would not have graduated from school any other way. Um, Why is that? So just a few of the stories that we, so at, at our particular graduation, it's a small number, 12 individuals, and each one is able to, um, to have something said about them. And we are, a, we, because of the, the, the small nature of our school, we actually have quite a few students stand up and, and speak and share their personal experiences. And one of our students is a, a, a Haitian refugee who came as a child and has grown up in our foster care system. Um, we had a, another student who, um, we had another student who, when she was 12 years old, saw her parents deported, and she's kind of been um, going, uh, doing things on her own as a very mature um, young person, uh, finding her path through our education system. And we have, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to, philosophically, I tend to be kind of a, a free market guy. We have school choice. We've talked about you know, ESAs and school choice and um, here in, in Arizona. And we aren't trying to be everything to everybody. Um, sometimes a market doesn't work for everybody. We see that with our homeless population. You know, it, that market works for four and a half million people, but yet we have, you know, maybe eight to 10,000 people for whom that doesn't work. And these are kids who, who need extra love, and extra assistance, uh, because they don't necessarily have uh, a parent who's helping them exercise school choice. And so as um, going back to this idea of we're not trying to be everything to everybody, we're find, trying to feel, fill a very specific niche to help our most vulnerable students for whom this marketplace in the system is not working. And, and I'm, I, cause that's where I'm getting at. Cause I, I, I sit there and I think, even in it, um, on the Phoenix Union level, what type of services, cause being an honest governing board, you're not in the business of trying to kick kids out. You wanna keep kids in. Absolutely. You use Title I, Title II, you use whatever mechanisms you have to address the services and needs of every single kid. I don't care if it's one kid. I don't, I don't care in the Maryville area, we do it. It's what you do in a public school setting. So you do what you can to keep these kids in school. You address their social and economic needs sometimes. So I, I sit there and think, what services would the accommodation school provide to students? Because I'm with you. Do whatever sure. we can 
to get kids from point A to point B so they can graduate, to reach that goal. We, we should be doing everything we can. So again, it goes back to what type of services. I'm a strong believer in the small school system. I mean, I'll be honest publicly here. Uh, when I started in the legislature, I was not very kind to charter schools. I was, this is early 2000s. I wasn't very kind. But now I, I do see the purpose of it now. I see the, the need for a small school setting. And Phoenix Union has kind of gone that, not my direction, but they have gone in that direction for small school city, this is small school settings. You see, uh, you see Bostrom, Desi, you see uh, Linda Brill, you see the special needs schools at every one of the major campuses. You see the online programs. So you, you see all these services that are being used to help homeless, to help refugees, to help kids that have behavioral health issues, to help kids that are in the foster care system. I'm a, I'm a big brother to a foster care kid right now. So I understand those challenges that he goes through and what, and he went through Phoenix Union and what is needed in order to help him. So it goes to my question. We have 80, 75 to 80 kids. If we did not have an accommodation school, could there be other avenues? I mean, Again, I get the school choice. I'm, I'm not, I'm not yeah. arguing that at all. But are there mechanisms or are there, is there a need for the accommodation school? That's where I'm getting it. Sure. Uh, um, Mr. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Gallardo, I, I, I would start with an emphatic yes. Um, these kids have been enrolled in a school before and they have left that school. And, and I don't think it's because um, the, the school forced them out in any way, shape, or form. It's because um, our systems that are currently in place are now able to motivate and capture this particular student that we have. And we can work with these kids in a very unique place. Um, we take them where they are. Um, we, we might have a student who comes to our campus and doesn't trust any adult in their life. And we kind of let them um, sit there uh, mull things over, and then when they are ready, we help them transition um, through the school day and attend classes. And, and candidly, there is nobody um, in the state of Arizona and very few people nationwide who are doing the work in the way that we're doing it and having the success with the population that we're having. And I would hope that we would have more schools come and tour our facility and see the work we're doing. We want it to be replicated. And if, if every school district had a school like this and was able to capture these students and help them graduate, I would be happy to shut down the accommodation district. Um, but currently, there is nothing like that. Uh, we recently had, you know, every time, <clears throat> Every time I mention an entity uh, when I'm having this conversation. Steve, Steve one second. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Let me, because this, we're, we're going really long and sure. I think we, I think we talked and, and I, I'm, I'm assuming you are the biggest proponent of, of what you guys are doing. You need to be. This is the county. We, we do everything. So let me, let me just cut. Let, let's just, let's just stop now because we have an executive session we have to get to. There's a lot of topics. Do you want to just do a quick summation and all? And I, we got to get. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank oh, by the way, I, I didn't. I unless it went over my head, you asked point blank how many students. I, I heard you met. Yeah. You graduated twelve. How many students did was oh, it? Right we have now? between eighty and hundred students. I eighty and hundred students. Okay. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Um, if I may, I, I just wanted to just finish by saying we, we look forward to having this conversation. Um, I want to continually invite you to come and see the work that we're doing. Um, we have had um, state legislators uh, go with us through juvenile detention. Thank you for joining us today, John. I would like Thank to you. personally invite each one of you to accompany us through juvenile detention to see the work that's going on. I'd like to invite you to come and see the instruction as it occurs in the accommodation school so that you know exactly what's happening and how, how we're spending every single dollar. So I just, I want that to be out there. Um, you're, you're invited, we welcome you. Graduation, every event that we have, 
we'd love to see you there. Okay. And, and, and Ms., Ms., Mr. Chairman, I mean, the juvenile detention is, is something a, a little bit different. Sure. And you showed it by separating the funds, but that's okay. It's a little bit different. So I kind of want to focus not so much on the juvenile detention, because I think that is uh, a, a requirement that, that we have to do. I really do believe that. Uh, real quickly, just a couple more questions. Um, how many teachers are currently filled or placed? How, yeah, so, 75 kids. So we have, uh, we have kind of two categories. We have teacher leaders. Um, and Adrian, how many te teacher leaders do we have? There's three teacher leaders. They're certified uh, teachers. Um, and then there's a, uh, oh. sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Welcome, Adrian. Uh, Chairman Hickman, uh, Supervisor Gallardo. Go, go ahead and reintroduce yourself. We heard you at the very at the very start. But. Okay, uh, Adrian D. Alba, uh, Chairman Hickman, and Supervisor Gallardo. I think that's the. Uh, um, we have uh, four certified teachers, so three are teacher leaders, and they actually run the school. Um, my role kind of involves a lot of different things. I. I help uh, when there's different issues that they may not uh, be aware of or that they don't have experience. I was a principal in the past. And then we have uh, um, REACH Associates. So the idea is to develop a pipeline of teachers. So these are people that are interested in becoming uh, teachers. And so they may sometimes teach a lesson under my certificate or they co-plan and we work together. Uh, so there's about three REACH Associates as well. And do you have any spots unfilled? Yes. Uh, well, this next year, yes. We, we are in dire need of a special ed teacher. Every school district. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every school district. And, yeah. yeah. And then um, because we have, we are using REACH Associates, which is, this is a model utilized by Arizona State University, the Next Generation Workforce Model. And so because we are utilizing that, it allows us to have a little bit more flexibility in who we hire uh, so that we can have more more teachers available. What, what about classified staff, counselors? We do not have a counselor. We uh, do bring in a counselor that works with students individually. Um, that's one of the things that we're working on with students. Uh, a lot of our students, uh, what do I say, are not receptive to counseling sometimes. And so it's working with them to really kind of shift that mindset. It is, it is in my opinion, just, um, gaining trust, and that's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it took me 10 years to earn the trust of the foster care kid that I have through the big brother system. Um, but I think in this population, uh, having counselors on staff is very critical, very critical. I can, I mean, I, I don't know the students, but I can just imagine the, usually this population of students, as you stated, um, face tremendous uh, uh, economic, social challenges, behavioral, Challenge. There's a whole array of issues that many of the kids face. Um, so, anyways, that's good. Okay. Um, well, before thank you. thank you. Before we adjourn, thanks. Thanks again uh, to you and your staff for joining us today and giving us that presentation and being willing to uh, answer questions. I would. I just like to say, I always like to end things like this with an action plan. I. We've done our budget, or we've mostly finished our budget. Um, so with that trend line and everything, I feel like what we have heard today is there is money to complete uh, this year, but we need to, we, uh, my expectations are there will be a forensic audit minus the, minus the colored shirts. Sure. Uh, that that uh, we will see quickly so we can go forward. Okay, is that is that everyone's thought up here? Is that what everyone's expectation is? Is that what your expectations are? Okay, very good. Mr. Chairman, I move that we go into executive Thank session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Do I have a second? We have a motion a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we will go to the 10th floor and lunch will be served. It'll be a working lunch.